Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com. Ciao ragazzi! Hi guys! I'm Desiree. Welcome to 10 ways to remember words. Associo parole nuove con parole che suonano simili nella mia lingua madre. I associate new words with words that sound similar in my native language. Ok, for example, yeah, we have with English and Italian a lot of words that are similar. For example, lingua, language, linguaggio. Cerco di usare la lingua abitualmente nel contesto della vita quotidiana. I try to use the language routinely in the context of daily life. Let's say you're washing the dishes and you think, oh, how do I say washing the dish in Italian? And then you start thinking about how to say that. Lavare i piatti. Just think about the things that you are doing and how you would explain them in the new language. Dico parole ad alta voce in modo che io possa davvero sentirle. I say words out loud so that I can actually hear them. This is a great thing to do. Like, my problem with English, especially in the beginning, I didn't really talk English, I didn't speak that with anyone, and that was a problem because I still now... Maybe if I hear a word, I know what it means, but then when I, I have to say that, I'm not sure about how to pronounce that. So yeah, practice to say words out loud. Guardo spesso i video in TV o su YouTube che sono stati progettati per i bambini. I often watch TV or YouTube videos that are designed for young children. Yeah, this is a great way because, for example, cartoons, so things that are for children, they make you understand what they're doing without saying that. Also, you should try watching something that you watched already so you can understand how to say the same thing that you already know in the new language that you're studying. I would do that. Imparo l'origine delle parole e come le diverse parole sono legate le une alle altre. I learn about the roots of words and how words are related to each other. For example, parole in Italian words and parlare, speak, it's the same root, same origin, the same radice, we would say, par, parola, par, parlare. Io uso le ripetizioni, leggere, scrivere e pronunciare le parole più e più volte. I use repetition, reading, writing and speaking words over and over again. Be careful with repetitions because, for example, to me, uh, after I repeat a word a lot of time, I'm like, does this word really exist? <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure anymore about the word itself. So yeah, do that, but maybe with a lot of words, not just one per time. Keep them written somewhere. So even later you can check if you know the words and actually see your improvement. Parlo il più spesso possibile con i madrelingua. I speak as often as possible with native speakers. Maybe also if they don't correct you because they're not teachers or because they just want to talk, it's still useful to see if they at least understand what you're trying to say. So don't worry about mistaking because it's okay and be careful not to switch to another language just because it's easier. Keep focused on using the new language. Provo a pensare in italiano così che diventi naturale. I try to think in Italian so it becomes natural to my thought process. I would advise you to do that at the end of the day, like trying to think in the new language about what you did today. In order to go to school, I was waiting for the bus. Per andare a scuola stavo il bus. Mm, what's waiting again? And you don't remember? You can check it, write it down, you will remember faster. Aspettare, by the way, if you want to know. Stavo aspettando il pullman. Ascolto canzoni e memorizzo i testi. I listen to songs and memorize the lyrics. This is a good thing to do because sometimes when you're listening to songs maybe you don't really understand what they're saying so it's good to search for lyrics. Try to sing along with them the next time you hear the song so you see if you really know, if you really learned the word. So sometimes in songs singers use words or expressions that we don't use in daily life. Be careful about that, but still it's a great exercise. Cerco di usare la parola nuova in una frase semplice, così imparo frasi intere e non solo singole parole. I try to use the new word in a simple sentence, so I learn whole phrases and not just individual words. When you learn a word, let's say for example telephone, 
you can think about a phrase. Um, I use the telephone to call my friends. Uso il telefono per chiamare i miei amici. And if you think about something in particular, like I use the telephone to call my cousin. Uso il telefono per chiamare i miei, mio. You can search for that word too, so you will learn another new word. Uh, if you're wondering, cousin is cugino. 15 happy words. Amare, love. Amare is a verb that you can use with a lot of stuff. For example, your boyfriend or girlfriend, you love them in a romantic way. Your family, you love them. Or your friends, dogs or cats or even food. You can just say, I love spaghetti, for example, and that's fine. Bello, beautiful. Bel bambino. Bella ragazza, what a beautiful girl. Bella giornata, what a beautiful day. And yeah, when you say just bello, it's something that you approve, you like. Like, how was your trip? Bello, it was cool, beautiful. Contento, happy. Noi siamo contenti. We are happy. Essere contento, to be happy. You can ask to a kid, for example, sei contento dei tuoi regali? Are you happy about your presents? Grande, great. Remember that grande literally means big, but in this case it's an exclamation like great, grande. Hey, I'm getting married. Great, grande. Orgoglioso, proud. I am very proud of my children. Sono molto orgoglioso dei miei bambini. I don't have kids, but I hope I can say this someday in my life. Piacere, like. Okay, piacere as a verb means like. For example, a me piace il blu. I like blue. But when you are introducing yourself, you can say, il mio nome è Desiree, piacere. My name is Desiree, nice to meet you. Because it would be Piacere di conoscerti, it's nice to meet you. Vivace, lively. That kid is really lively. Quel bambino è molto vivace. So yeah, means he's cheerful and wants to play a lot, maybe. And never asleep, probably. <laughs> yeah, also you can say about a city, it's a lively city. È una città vivace. Also a color can be vivace. È un colore molto vivace. It's a lively color. Rilassato, relaxed. Ah, sono così rilassato. Ah, I'm so relaxed. Like, I really need to take a break and go on vacation to relax. Ho proprio bisogno di prendere una pausa, andare in vacanza e rilassarmi. You can also use that as an adjective to people, like, he's a relaxed person. È una persona rilassata. Buffo, funny. Buffo, it's not the same as divertente, that is another way to say funny. For example, that movie was really fun. Quel film era molto divertente. Yeah, I would say that divertente can be used for everything, while buffo is something more particular. Buffo is a kind of sweet way to be funny. Like, you can say that uh, Kitty is buffo. It makes you laugh, but not like humor, but more like, oh, <laughs> energico energetic, so someone with a lot of energy, like uh, for example if we just finished playing volleyball and you're like oh I'm so tired, sono così stanco, but that person goes like hey why don't we play football now, hey perché non giochiamo a calcio ora, questa è una persona energica, it's an energetic person, entusiasta, excited, she was so excited about the movie, lei era così entusiasta del film. He's really excited about his birthday. È entusiasta del suo compleanno. Can be used with boys and girls without changing. It's always entusiasta. Sono entusiasta della vita. I'm excited about life. Fiducioso, hopeful. I trust people. I am a person that can be called fiduciosa. So yeah, this adjective changes. Fiducioso and fiduciosa. Sono fiducioso riguardo al futuro. I'm hopeful about future. Gentile, kind. È una persona gentile. It's a kind person. È sempre gentile con i bambini. It's always kind to kids. Oh, you can also refer about some taste. Uh, you're eating a cake and you say, oh, that has a kind taste. It's not too strong, 
Not too sweet, maybe. Not bitter. It's a kind taste. Ridere. Laugh. That's the secret of life. Ridere. Laugh a lot. È una persona che ride sempre. It's a person who always laughs or who loves to laugh, che ama ridere. Soddisfatto. Satisfied. Sono soddisfatto dei miei risultati. I'm satisfied with my results. Sono soddisfatto della mia vita. I'm satisfied about my life. And that's, I think, the goal for everyone. So that's why this is the last of our 15 happy words. 10 Italian foods. Bagna cauda. Bagna cauda is a typical food of Piemonte. It's a dialect expression. So in Italian, it would mean cauda from caldo, hot, and bagna is sauce, so hot sauce. Basically, it's made with garlic, oil, and anchovies. Since it's hot, it's typical of autumn, but I would say winter, but it's a strong taste and people say that you can know if someone ate that the day before. So yeah, don't eat bagna cauda before a date. Crostata. It's basically a tart, like cheese thick. So it's sweet and you can find that with marmalade. Recently also um, chocolate cream. The stripes that you put on top, they are like these, so crossed. That's why I would say it's easy to remember crostata, because it's made of crosses, basically. Lasagne. This is probably what everyone knows after pizza and spaghetti. Lasagne is made of this flat pasta. It's flat and long and large that you put at the bottom and then you put cheese and ragu that it's meat sauce, and then again, pasta, ragu, cheese, pasta, ragu, cheese, pasta, ragu, cheese. You can go on forever if you manage to. My grandma goes on with floors like 14. I counted that once. While my mom stays with seven at the maximum. Also, if you don't like meat or you don't want to eat that, you can just put pasta and spinach and cheese. There's a lot of things that you can do with the shape of lasagna, but it's not real lasagna. Still, lasagna is the best. Minestrone. Okay, this is basically a soup with vegetables. And it can be with pieces of vegetables. So you cut it and you put it inside water, make it boil, blah, blah, blah. Or you do that and then at the end, you chop it to make it more like a cream. As long as it's a soup and you like it, you can call it minestrone. Minestrone literally means a big minestra. Because when you put one at the end of a word, it becomes bigger. And minestra is a soup. So it's a big, big, big soup. Like tavolo, table, tavolone, a big table. Orecchiette con le cime di rapa. This is a dish that is typical from South Italy. It's made with turnip, especially with the part on top of that, the green one. We have endless types of pasta, like hundreds. For example, this one, orecchiette. It's small, like this, and it's not flat, okay? So the sauce can go inside. It literally means small ears. Ear is orecchio, and ette makes things smaller. Like one made things bigger, ette makes things smaller. So small ears with turning. Panna cotta. Panna is the cream that we use. It can be Sweet or salty, it depends on which one you are using, but we use the same word, that it's panna. Cotta means baked, in fact, it's cooked, and you can eat that as it is, or add chocolate cream, chocolate sauce, or caramel. So yeah, it's a kind of pudding, but not flavored. It's just panna, so cream, white cream. Parmigiana. Okay, do you remember what I told you about lasagne? that you do a lot of floors, basically. It's the same, but it's not made of pasta, but eggplant. And then you put, again, tomato sauce and cheese. And this time, cheese is different because with lasagna, it's besciamella, while with parmigiana, you can use a lot of them. I would say maybe pecorino. Here, too, there are a lot of types of parmigiana, but yeah, remember that parmigiana has eggplant. And a lot of times, parmigiano, a name of cheese. Polenta. The first thing that you think when you think about polenta 
it's winter because it's hot and it's salty. It's kind of, so it's flour made of cereals. There are a lot of types of polenta, not the polenta itself, but how you eat that. For example, polenta valdostana, so you eat polenta with cheese or carbonara. Maybe the most famous one is called polenta concha, made with basically fat things. Tiramisu. Tiramisu, it's a dessert. What you really need to do tiramisu is mascarpone. That it's a particular cheese, sweet cheese, fat cheese, I would say. The classical one is biscuits with coffee, mascarpone, and chocolate. And that's delicious. And yeah, also sometimes people would add alcohol to have a stronger taste. Salame dolce, it's a salame, but it's sweet. So it's made of chocolate. And the white things, so the fat that you would see inside salami, is made by biscuits. But you can do that with children. It's kind of fun because you smash biscuits and then put it with chocolate that was with sugar and butter, and then you shape it as a salame, and then you put it in the fridge, freezer maybe, and then you wait, and then you eat that, and it's good. Yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah, the top 10 compliments you will always want to hear in my language. So let's start. Sei bello. You're handsome. Sei bello. You're handsome. You can actually use the female version as well. Uh, if you want to say to a girl or a woman that she's beautiful, you can say, Sei bella. You're beautiful. Sei un amico favoloso. You are an awesome friend. Sei un amico favoloso. You are an awesome friend. Means that you are a beautiful friend. So, sei un amico favoloso if you want to compliment a friend of yours in Italian. Il tuo curriculum è impressionante. Your resume is impressive. Il tuo curriculum è impressionante. Your resume is impressive. This is actually very good when you want to talk with someone about his job and you're actually looking at, at the CV, you know, and you want to compliment the guy or the girl or the woman, uh, whoever it is, you know, for uh, the, the, his um, job skills. Then you say, il tuo curriculum è impressionante. Also, you can say, il tuo curriculum va molto bene. Ottimo lavoro. Great job. Ottimo lavoro. Great job. Means uh, you actually say ottimo lavoro to someone when uh, um, the, 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 the work, uh, the, the job that uh, he has been asking uh, to do is just perform at the best, you know. So you can also say lavoro eccellente as ottimo lavoro. They are the same thing. So you can say Ottimo lavoro or lavoro eccellente, which means like they, they are actually the same thing. Quella giacca sembra carina addosso a te. That jacket looks nice on you. Quella giacca sembra carina addosso a te. That jacket looks nice on you. So this is something that you want to say when someone just is dressed in a way that you like, you know. So you, you can also say I like the way you, you I, 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 I like the way you are dressed up, you know, like, and you can say, uh, mi piace come ti vesti, mi piace come ti vesti, which is pretty similar to it. Hai buon gusto, you have a good taste. Hai buon gusto, you have a good taste. So, hai buon gusto is actually, you know, um, usually telling people, have, have good taste, uh, you know, especially for the fashion, you know, and all this kind of thing. So uh, you can always say to an Italian person, I buon gusto, they will always appreciate it. Il tuo sorriso è bellissimo. Your smile is beautiful. Il tuo sorriso è bellissimo. Your smile is beautiful. It's not pretty much nothing to say about this phrase, it's just something um, really uh, nice to say, your smile is beautiful. Il tuo sorriso è bellissimo. Very good compliment. Sembri stupendo. <laughs> you look gorgeous. Sembri stupendo. You look gorgeous. Okay, you might not say this to a guy, I mean, or a girl, or you know, you might be feel a bit shy, things like that. But you might think about this, you know, in that case, you say, Sembri stupendo. You know, you're, you're like, you're, you're amazing, you look amazing, you know. You look gorgeous in this, in this case, um, as a compliment, you know. Ti trovo in splendida forma. You look in good shape. 
Ti trovo in splendida forma. You look in good shape. Another very nice compliment to do, to, to, to say to someone. That means that, you know, your body, your shape is, you know, is okay. So, you know, and people notice it. So if you want to say it to someone like, uh, that you haven't seen for a long time, an Italian friend of yours, you know, you can say, ti trovo in splendida forma. And you will appreciate it, for sure. Senza di te non sarebbe lo stesso. Without you, it wouldn't be the same. Senza di te non sarebbe lo stesso. Without you, it wouldn't be the same. So this is something quite powerful to say to someone. It's more than a compliment, really. You know, it's, it's when you you actually cannot say without uh, the person or things like that. So it's something really, really important and um, something that you might bear in mind because it's really important. Senza di te non sarebbe lo stesso. So it's something really, really, really nice to say to someone. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what's the difference between sono and sto? If you study Italian, you may often come across sentences such as sto bene, grazie, meaning I'm fine, thanks, or sono italiana, which means I'm Italian. Sono is a conjugated form of the verb essere. Sto is a conjugated form of the verb stare. Now, both Italian verbs essere and stare can be translated as to be in English, but they are used differently. Essere is a direct equivalent of to be. Generally, it expresses a condition. You can use it for lots of different things like identity, as in sono Paola, I'm Paola, profession, as in sono un insegnante, I'm a teacher, nationality, as in sono italiana, I'm Italian, physical aspects, as in sono alta, I'm tall, emotions, as in sono felice, I'm happy. On the other hand, the meaning of the verb stare depends on the context we use it in. Let's see some of the most common ones. To be, as in sto bene, I'm well. To stay, as in oggi sto a casa, I'll stay home today. To fit, as in la maglietta non mi sta, the t-shirt doesn't fit me. To stand, stare in piedi, to lie, stare sdraiato. Also, a lot of idiomatic expressions use stare instead of essere, for example, Stai zitto, be quiet, stai fermo, be still, stai attento, be careful. Stare is also used with the germ verb forms in progressive tenses. For example, sto studiando italiano means I'm studying Italian or stavano correndo meaning they were running. To sum it up, we could say that stare refers to something that happens while essere refers to something that is. Here is another tip. Keep in mind that sto is commonly used with adverbs, as in sto bene, I am doing well. Sono isn't. Sono can be used only with adjectives and in sono italiana, I am Italian. Hi everyone, do you know how to say I love you in Italian? In this lesson, you'll learn three different ways to say it. Let's start with how to express your feelings to your loved one. Ti amo. Ti amo. Ti amo. Or, if you want to explain those butterflies in your stomach, you can say... Ho una cotta per te. Ho una cotta per te. Ho una cotta per te. And when you feel that I love you is not enough, you can say... Le parole non possono descrivere il mio amore per te. Le parole non possono descrivere il mio amore per te. Le parole non possono descrivere il mio amore per te. 10 phrases for surviving back 
to school. Something that when I used to go to school used to freak me out, you know. Of, of course, I mean, everyone loves holidays, so I was very scared, you know, I was a bit panicking for my uh, for the beginning of a new year, really. All the time, <laughs> you know, so it's quite normal, you know. So let's start our lesson. Zaino, backpack. Zaino, backpack. Vado a scuola con lo zaino in spalla. I go to school with a backpack. Compagno di classe. Classmate. Compagno di classe. Classmate. I miei compagni di classe a volte sono dispettosi. Sometimes my classmates are annoying. I used to love my classmates. Uh, my classmates used to be my friends. But of course I had also some people quite annoying. But anyway, my, my best memories are from my, from my school period are uh, because of my classmates, really. So, compiti. Homework. Compiti. Homework. L'insegnante di matematica ci dà sempre molti compiti da fare a casa. The math teacher always gives us too much homework. So, uh, homeworks as tests at school are a bit annoying as well, uh, in a way. I mean, they're really useful, you know. You can also say in Italian, i compiti non mi piacciono, or non mi piace fare i compiti, which means um, I don't like to do my homework. Esame. Exam. Esame. Exam. Questo fine settimana ci prepariamo insieme per l'esame di latino. This weekend we'll prepare for the Latin exam together. <laughs> I actually study Latin at school myself. It's a very interesting language really. Um, it's actually the base of the Italian language. The language itself, it's, it's built uh, in a completely different way than Italian. And also, if you study Latin, it's very useful for your logical reasoning. So yeah, it's very interesting, it's a very interesting language. Pausa estiva, summer break, pausa estiva, summer break. Non voglio studiare tutti i giorni durante la pausa estiva. I don't want to study every day during the summer break. <laughs> okay, this is quite common. I mean, uh, it's a bit like the homework thing. Even though you have spare time and things like that, I mean, you have to do your homework because it's part of your duties to be a student, really. Scuola. School. Scuola. School. Nella scuola dei miei sogni c'è spazio per tutti per studiare in biblioteca e in giardino. In my dream school there's enough space for everybody to study in the library and outdoor. This is pretty much my dream also. I think that staying outside, you know, if you have like the possibility, you know, at your school, in your school, if you have like a, a piece of garden or things like that, it's very nice to get out, you know, and to teach your students uh, or, you know, if you are a student, in a way you can ask your teacher for one time and you can experience the beauty of a lesson outside, you know, to make lessons, I mean, not just to play. Um, I used to like this. I used to have a teacher like that when I was um, in my primary school and I really like her, really. Studiare, to study. Studiare, to study. Ho deciso di studiare l'italiano come seconda lingua. I decided to study Italian as my second language. I'm very proud if you're doing so, really. I think that Italian is a very nice language. You can also say Sto imparando l'italiano, which means I am learning Italian. È il primo giorno di lezione. It's the first day of class. È il primo giorno di lezione. It's the first day of class. Siamo nella stessa classe. We are in the same class. Siamo nella stessa classe. We are in the same class. Qual è la tua specializzazione? What's your major? Qual è la tua specializzazione? What's your major? You can also say in Italian in che cosa ti stai specializzando, which is uh, pretty much the same thing. Hi everyone! Do you know the 1000 most useful phrases in Italian? In this lesson, you'll be able to know all of them.
So sit back, relax, and have a cup of tea as you listen and learn. Dov'è il bagno? Scusa. Grande. Ho prenotato. Quanto costa? Che cos'è questo? Grazie. Veramente? Potrebbe farmi uno sconto? La connessione wifi è gratuita? Potrei avere il conto? Ha dei consigli? Posso donarlo? You just learned the 1000 most useful phrases in Italian. And if you're interested in learning more, try learning the core 2000 word list. With this, you'll understand 95% of the language. And best of all, this is not a joke. Check out the description below and go to italianpod101.com now. See you next time. And break up lines. I know it's a sad topic, but we're going to do that just in case. Just don't think that you really need that. But still, break up lines. Oh, oh. Dobbiamo parlare. We need to talk. This is always bad. Not only for breaking up. It always can mean that something happened and we need to talk about that. But yeah, it's not something happy. Because otherwise I would say something like Ah, vorrei parlare, vorrei parlare di, I would like to talk about, for example, vorrei parlare delle vacanze, I would like to talk about vacation, or vorrei parlarti, I would like to talk to you. But dobbiamo parlare, we need to talk, is extremely extreme, <laughs> like, means prepare yourself. There was something wrong, or I discovered something, so yeah. Be prepared when you hear dobbiamo parlare. We need to talk. Dovremmo iniziare a vedere altre persone. We should start seeing other people. And that means each of you is gonna see another person. Doesn't mean that you're gonna meet new friends. Nope. Would be nice, but doesn't mean that. Maybe it's not bad if you see someone else. I will not get angry. <laughs> yeah, it kind of an indirect way. I wouldn't like that and yeah, but probably it's just to start the discussion. So yeah, I mean, I don't judge you if you're an open, open couple, but I wouldn't think that the discussion would start with this phrase. È la cosa migliore. It's for the best. That sounds hypocritical, in my opinion, because if I'm saying that to my boyfriend that I want to break up with. It's the best thing for me, not for you, of course, because if you want to keep this relationship, if you want to stay with someone and that someone tells you it's the best thing, it's for the best, of course you would answer who's best, because not mine if I want to stay with you. È solo che non sono pronto per questo tipo di rapporto. I'm just not ready for this kind of relationship. That sounds fake, in my opinion. But yeah, you can, like, if someone tells you that, you can be hurt, hurt because, yeah, why? Do you think it's too serious or you just want to have fun? So, well, it's still better than being told that later on, like, oh, I wasn't prepared for this thing, so I cheated on you. No, of course, it's better to know that before, but still, it's not fun to break up anyway. And I'm just not ready for this kind of relationship. È solo che non ti amo più. I just don't love you anymore. That can't be helped. Maybe people would be happier if you told them before. And like, listen, there's something that is not going well. I'm not sure. But not out of the blue. I don't love you anymore. Oh, okay. It's not something that you can really answer to. It's just a fact. And yeah, this probably really means you're breaking up without explanation or stuff like no but we can still do that we can still manage somehow if people tell you i just don't love you anymore means i don't even want to try so yeah that's it basically you're done ho bisogno di concentrarmi sulla mia carriera i need to focus on my career depending on people they have different priorities And yeah, you can still maybe say that you will not be an obstacle for that person's career. And yeah, maybe it's not that bad. They're just telling you, 
hey, I want to focus on my career. So if we still want to stay together, you have to keep in mind that you are not my first priority. If for this reason they are breaking up with you, means they don't want to think about anything else, basically. So yeah, once again, done. <laughs> Io non sono la tua altezza. I'm not good enough for you. Okay, to this phrase, people can always answer, who are you to judge? I mean, I'm fine with you. Why are you saying that you're not enough? Probably because you don't want to tell me that I am the problem and you just want to break up. So I wouldn't like that. Just explain to me or just say to me, I don't like you because this, this and this, but don't say to me, I'm not enough for you, because that would be up to me to decide. Non sei tu, sono io. It's not you, it's me. You don't want to say that, that your partner is at fault, but you don't want to stay with him anymore. It's like saying, oh, you're perfect, so you can't even improve. There's nothing to anymore. It's just not you, it's my problem. But I don't want to stay with you. Basically, that's the meaning. Penso che abbiamo bisogno di una pausa. I think we need a break. Let pausa, it's pause, break. Let's maybe not talk to each other for some days, weeks. Yeah, the problem in these cases is that you don't really know how long is a break. So it's so ambiguous. Restiamo solo amici. Let's just be friends. And yeah, so if it's before being a couple, you can say, no, it's better if we if we're just friends. Otherwise, after being a couple with the breaking up, it's restiamo amici. But in that case, I would say there's no solo. Because solo means only. So I would say that before being a couple, let's just, let's just be friends. And if it's after the breaking up, it's let's be friends. This, rimaniamo amici. And that can happen if you were friends even before being a couple. Rimaniamo solo amici. Let's just be friends. Before being a couple, let's be friends. Rimaniamo amici. After being a couple. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how are verbs conjugated? English verbs are not heavily inflected. In fact, there are just three endings you can add to the infinitive of regular verbs. S for the third person, singular present tense, for example, plays. ING for the gerund, playing, and ID for the past tense, played. Most combinations of tense, aspect, mood, and voice can be expressed using auxiliary and modal verbs. Italian, on the other hand, is a heavily inflected language. Italian verbs have lots of different endings depending on their subject, tense and mood. The infinitive is the unconjugated form of the verb, the one you'll find in the dictionary. Italian verbs are divided into three main conjugation groups according to their infinitive endings. Verbs of the first conjugation, and in are, for example, parlare, meaning to speak. Verbs of the second conjugation in ere, for example, leggere, meaning to read. Verbs of the third conjugation and in ire, for example, dormire, meaning to sleep. Each group has a different and regular conjugation pattern. Even if there are a lot of irregular verbs, most Italian verbs follow one of these three systems of conjugation. Each conjugation pattern has different endings you'll need to add to the verb stem. To get the stem of a verb, all you have to do is take away are, ere, or ire. So the stem of parlare is parl, the stem of leggere is legge, and the stem of dormire is dorm. Verb endings are affected by mood, tense, person, number, and sometimes even gender. Let's take a look. Italian verbs have four finite moods. They are the indicative to express facts, for example, io dormo, I sleep. The imperative to give orders, for example, dormi, sleep. 
the subjunctive to express doubt, hope, fear and possibility. For example, che io beva, I drink. The conditional to express an action that depends on another fact that may or may not happen. For example, io leggerei, I would read. There are also three non-finite moods, which usually have just one form. The infinitive, which is also the dictionary form. For example, parlare, to speak. The gerund for progressive tenses, for example, leggendo, reading. The participle, generally used as adjective or with the other verbs, for example, parlato, spoken. While mood shows the manner in which an action is expressed, the tense is what specifies when the action happens. The only Italian mood that has all eight tenses in the indicative, which is also the most used mood. The only present tense is the present, io parlo, I speak. Past tenses include present perfect, io ho parlato, I have spoken. Imperfect, io parlavo, I spoke. Past perfect, io avevo parlato, I had spoken. Absolute past, io parlai, I spoke. Pre-trade perfect, io ebbi parlato, I had spoken. Future tenses are the future, io parlerò, I will speak. The future perfect, io avrò parlato, I will have spoken. The other moods only have a couple of tenses, usually present and past, except for the subjunctive, which has a few more. This looks like a lot, and it actually is one of the most challenging things even for native speakers. But don't panic, if you get started with the regular verbs in the indicative present tense, you will soon familiarize yourself with the conjugation patterns. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! See you soon! Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what are the top 10 most common Italian idioms? It might not be necessary to know idioms in order to communicate in Italian, but they are very effective and fun. Also, if you can use some idioms, you'll sound more fluent. Are you ready to find out 10 of the most common Italian idioms? Let's start. In bocca al lupo. This literally means into the mouth of the wolf. The origin of this expression isn't clear, but Italians use it very, very often to wish someone good luck. If someone says in bocca al lupo to you, you should reply crepi il lupo, may the wolf croak. Costare un occhio dalla testa, literally, to cost an eye of the head. This has basically the same meaning as the English idiom, to cost an arm and a leg. It means that something costs so much that you'd have to sell a part of your body to be able to afford it. Essere al verde. The literal translation is to be at the green, but it actually means to be broke. This expression is said to have originated in Florence, where the bottom half of auctioneer candles were painted green. When the candle reached the green, the flow of money will come to a stop. Another theory is that the color refers to the inside of a wallet, which you could see once you were out of money. Tra il dire e il fare c'è di mezzo il mare. Idiomatic expressions about the sea are quite common in Italian. This one means between saying and doing there is a sea in the middle. It means easier said than done. Italians often shorten this expression and just say tra il dire e il fare. Una volta ogni morte di papa. Once every time a pope dies. The English equivalent of this expression is once in a blue moon. Both are used about something happening very rarely. Essere al settimo cielo. This idiom has the perfect analog in English. To be in seventh heaven, meaning to be extremely happy. 
This expression comes from the philosophy on which Dante's comedy is based. According to this philosophy, the Earth is in the center of the universe, surrounded by seven concentric heavens. Seventh heaven was the highest degree of elevation for man. Dormire come un sasso, to sleep like a stone. This idiom is basically the same as English, to sleep like a log. It means that someone is sleeping so soundly that they look like an inanimate object. You can also say dormire come un giro, to sleep like a dormouse. Acqua in bocca. The literal translation is water in your mouth. If someone says acqua in bocca to you, they want you to keep it a secret, because of course you can't say anything if your mouth is full of water. Il gioco non vale la candela. The game isn't worth the candle. This expression is of medieval origin. Back then, people used candles at night, and candles could be expensive. Card players used to repay the owner of the house that hosted them with either money or a candle. The saying started to spread among players to indicate games where the winnings were so low that they wouldn't even cover the small expense left for the candle. Tagliare la corda, to cut the rope. This expression means to run away from a situation. It originates from the rope that was used to keep boats tied to the shore. To sail, it was necessary to free the boat first, but if someone was in great hurry, the rope would be cut. Pretty interesting, right? That's all for this lesson and this series. Thank you for listening and we'll see you in another series. A presto! See you soon! Hi everyone! I'm Ilaria from ItalianPod101.com. Nice to see you again. So, do you know how to say I love you in Italian? In this lesson you learn three different ways on how to say I love you in Italian and also one special phrase for Valentine's Day. So, are you ready for the celebration of love? Let's start! Let's start with the most common phrase. Ti amo. Ti amo. I love you. The phrase is direct, so you should only use it when you're confessing your love. want to be less direct, you can also use this phrase Sei così importante per me Sei così importante per me Which in English means You mean so much to me Sei così importante per me What if you want to be more romantic in expressing your love for someone? Here's a phrase for you. Le parole non possono descrivere il mio amore per te. Le parole non possono descrivere il mio amore per te. Which in English means words cannot describe my love for you. So Le parole non possono descrivere il mio amore per te. <laughs> so, now you know three different ways to say I love you in Italian. And here's another one. What if you want to spend the Valentine's Day with someone special? In this case you can say Vuoi essere il mio Valentino? Vuoi essere il mio Valentino? Which in English means Will you be my Valentine? <laughs> okay, now let's wrap up this lesson by recapping what we've learned. Listen to the expressions and repeat after me. I love you. Ti amo. Ti amo. 
you mean so much to me. Sei così importante per me. Sei così importante per me. Words can't describe my love for you. Le parole non possono descrivere il mio amore per te. Le parole non possono descrivere il mio amore per te. Will you be my valentine? Vuoi essere il mio valentino? Vuoi essere il mio valentino? Okay guys, well done! Now, here's a fun fact. Do you know which pictures in Italy symbolizes Valentine's Day? It's the kiss by Francisco Ayetz and is preserved in uh, Academy Brera in Milan. Um, this painting uh, represents the passionate kiss between two lovers that are destined to be separated. So guys, today you learn three different ways to say I love you in Italian and a special phrase for the magic Valentine's Day. I'll see you next time. Grazie. <laughs> Ciao. Hi guys, welcome to ItalianPod101.com. Today we are going to talk about a very delicate topic. The top 10 phrases tourists should never use. So let's start. È disgustoso. It's disgusting. È disgustoso. It's disgusting. You can also use the word uh, which is uh, less formal than uh, disgustoso. Non mi piace. I don't like it. Simply, you don't have to say it's disgusting. You can say I'm sorry, I don't like it. So that would be mi dispiace, ma non mi piace, which is definitely better than è disgustoso. Il mio paese è migliore. My country is better. Il mio paese è migliore. My country is better. So this is actually a kind of patriotism, I think, that you shouldn't have when you are around the world. I mean, because you should be like open-minded, you know, and open to new culture and things like that. So it's better not to say this. Sta zitto. Shut up. Sta zitto. Shut up. You can say um, also fa silenzio, which is the same, but see, of course, it's not nothing, it's not something uh, nice. I mean, you can say that to your children, for instance, you know, if they make a lot of noise, you know, you can say um, fa silenzio or sta zitto or basta, which is like stop. But of course, uh, it's not nice to say this to, um, to someone, you know, that you don't know actually, but even to people that you know. Non sono molto interessata alla vostra cultura. I'm not very interested in your culture. Non sono molto interessata alla vostra cultura. I'm not very interested in your culture. It's better maybe, you know, to say that you prefer other cultures rather than say I don't like your culture, you know. Non mi piace conoscere nuove persone. I don't like meeting new people. Non mi piace conoscere nuove persone. I don't like meeting new people. Which is actually impossible if you travel, so... <laughs> it's still the same thing. I mean, if you are open-minded when you travel, because you should be, in order, you know, to tolerate as well differences, you know, because uh, the world is, is so, there is such a variety. And that actually uh, is also why it's so beautiful. Andiamo a mangiare solo a McDonald's. Let's just eat at McDonald's. Andiamo a mangiare solo a McDonald's. Let's just eat at McDonald's. Of course, I mean, if you travel around the world, you're supposed to try things which are different from your ordinary things, you know. Questo ha un sapore terribile. This taste is awful. Questo ha un sapore terribile. This taste is awful. Instead of saying this, you can say, I'm sorry, but I don't like it. So it would still be, uh, mi dispiace, ma non mi piace. 
ho intenzione di passare la giornata in albergo. I'm going to spend the day in the hotel. Ho intenzione di passare la giornata in albergo. I'm going to spend the day in the hotel. Questo è stupido. This is stupid. Questo è stupido. This is stupid. Yeah, I mean, still, uh, remember that those are the words that should, you should not use. <laughs> should never use. So learn, learn them in order not to use them. Voi siete incivili. You people are uncivilized. Voi siete incivili. You people are uncivilized. So remember these words, please, and not use them when you are traveling around the world, guys, okay? Uh, thanks very much for listening. Those were the top 10 words tourists should never use. Uh, I will see you next time. Thanks from italianpod101.com. Here is Ilaria. Please comment, subscribe, and let us know what you want to hear in our nice Italian language. Nice to see you guys. Take care. Next time. Always take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hi, guys. Ciao, ragazzi. I'm Desiree. Sono Desiree. And welcome to 15 Happy Words. Amare. Love. Amare is a verb that you can use with a lot of stuff. For example, your boyfriend or girlfriend. You love them in a romantic way. Your family. You love them. Or your friends, dogs, or cats, or even food. You can just say, I love spaghetti, for example, and that's fine. Bello, beautiful. Bel bambino. Bella ragazza, what a beautiful girl. Bella giornata, what a beautiful day. And yeah, when you say just bello, it's something that you approve, you like. Like, how was your trip? Bello, it was cool, beautiful. Contento, happy. Noi siamo contenti. We are happy. Essere contento, to be happy. You can ask to a kid, for example, sei contento dei tuoi regali? Are you happy about your presents? Grande, great. Remember that grande literally means big, but in this case it's an exclamation like great, grande. Hey, I'm getting married. Great, grande. Orgoglioso, proud. I am very proud of my children. Sono molto orgoglioso dei miei bambini. I don't have kids, but I hope I can say this someday in my life. Piacere, like. Okay, piacere as a verb means like. For example, a me piace il blu. I like blue. But when you are introducing yourself, you can say, il mio nome è Desiree, piacere. My name is Desiree, nice to meet you. Because it would be Piacere di conoscerti, it's nice to meet you. Vivace, lively. That kid is really lively. Quel bambino è molto vivace. So yeah, means he's cheerful and wants to play a lot, maybe. And never asleep, probably. <laughs> yeah, also you can say about a city, it's a lively city. È una città vivace. Also a color can be vivace. È un colore molto vivace. It's a lively color. Rilassato, relaxed. Ah, sono così rilassato. Ah, I'm so relaxed. Like, I really need to take a break and go on vacation to relax. Ho proprio bisogno di prendere una pausa, andare in vacanza e rilassarmi. You can also use that as an adjective to people, like, he's a relaxed person. È una persona rilassata. Buffo, funny. Buffo, it's not the same as divertente, that is another way to say funny. For example, that movie was really fun. Quel film era molto divertente. Yeah, I would say that divertente can be used for everything, while buffo is something more particular. Buffo is a kind of sweet way to be funny. Like, you can say that uh, Kitty is buffo. It makes you laugh, but not like humor, but more like, oh, <laughs> energico energetic, so someone with a lot of energy, like uh, for example if we just finished playing volleyball and you're like oh I'm so tired, sono così stanco, but that person goes like hey why don't we play football now, hey perché non giochiamo a calcio ora, questa è una persona energica, it's an energetic person, entusiasta, excited, 
She was so excited about the movie. Lei era così entusiasta del film. He's really excited about his birthday and entusiasta del suo compleanno. Can be used with boys and girls without changing. It's always entusiasta. Sono entusiasta della vita. I'm excited about life. Fiducioso. Hopeful. I trust people. I am a person that can be called fiduciosa. So, yeah, this adjective changes. Fiducioso and fiduciosa. Sono fiducioso riguardo al futuro. I'm hopeful about future. Gentile. Kind. È una persona gentile. It's a kind person. È sempre gentile con i bambini. It's always kind to kids. Oh, you can also refer about some taste. Uh, you're eating a cake and you say, oh, that has a kind taste. It's not too strong, not too sweet, maybe not bitter. It's a kind taste. Ridere, laugh. That's the secret of life. Ridere, laugh a lot. È una persona che ride sempre. It's a person who always laughs or who loves to laugh, che ama ridere. Soddisfatto, satisfied. Sono soddisfatto dei miei risultati. I'm satisfied with my results. Sono soddisfatto della mia vita. I'm satisfied about my life. And that's, I think, the goal for everyone. So that's why this is the last of our 15 happy words. Comment with your favorite one or with others happy words that you can think of. And remember to subscribe. Ciao ciao. Bye bye. If you're happy and you know, clap your hands. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what's the difference between sono and sto? If you study Italian, you may often come across sentences such as sto bene, grazie, meaning I'm fine, thanks, or sono italiana, which means I'm Italian. Sono is a conjugated form of the verb essere. Sto is a conjugated form of the verb stare. Now, both Italian verbs essere and stare can be translated as to be in English, but they are used differently. Essere is a direct equivalent of to be. Generally, it expresses a condition. You can use it for lots of different things like identity, as in sono Paola, I'm Paola, profession, as in sono un insegnante, I'm a teacher, nationality, as in sono italiana, I'm Italian, physical aspects, as in sono alta, I'm tall, emotions, as in sono felice, I'm happy. On the other hand, the meaning of the verb stare depends on the context we use it in. Let's see some of the most common ones. To be, as in sto bene, I'm well. To stay, as in oggi sto a casa, I'll stay home today. To fit, as in la maglietta non mi sta, the t-shirt doesn't fit me. To stand, stare in piedi, to lie, stare sdraiato. Also, a lot of idiomatic expressions use stare instead of essere, for example, Stai zitto, be quiet, stai fermo, be still, stai attento, be careful. Stare is also used with the germ verb forms in progressive tenses. For example, sto studiando italiano means I'm studying Italian or stavano correndo meaning they were running. To sum it up, we could say that stare refers to something that happens while essere refers to something that is. Here is another tip. Keep in mind that sto is commonly used with adverbs, as in sto bene, I am doing well. Sono isn't. Sono can be used only with adjectives and in sono italiana, I am Italian. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon. Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com. Hi. 
Welcome to Introduction to Italian. My name is Alicia, and I'm joined by... Hi, everyone. I'm Marika. In this lesson, you'll learn the basics of Italian grammar. Word order refers to the order in which words are structured to form a sentence in a given language. Consider the English sentence, I ate an apple. But first, let's remove the article an here for simplicity. So we're just left with, I ate apple. The basic word order for English is subject, verb, object, or SVO for short. If we break down the English sentence, I ate apple, we can see that the subject I is presented first, followed by the verb ate, and then finally the object apple is positioned last. This is the basic word order for sentences in English. Now let's compare that same sentence, I ate an apple, in Italian. Io ho mangiato una mela. Like before, let's remove the article to keep it simple, so we are just left with the words. If we break down the Italian sentence, we get the subject io, meaning I, then comes the verb ho mangiato, meaning ate, and finally we have the object mela, meaning apple. The basic word order for Italian then is SBO. It's the same as English. This means that you can convert an English sentence into Italian simply by replacing the English words with Italian words, and you'll still be understood. Italian word order, however, is much more flexible than English. If we swapped the subject and object around, we'd get apple ate I in English, which changes the meaning of the sentence completely. In Italian, however, the core meaning of the sentence does not change it would still essentially be, I ate apple. Me la ho mangiato io. As you can see, the word order of Italian is quite flexible. More often than not, if you wanted to say, I ate an apple in Italian, you would not say, Io ho mangiato una mela. Instead, you would more likely say, ate an apple in Italian. Ho mangiato una mela. This is because Italian is a null subject language where the word for the pronoun is omitted because it's already implied. This is because all of the information can be derived from the way the verb is conjugated in the sentence. For example, the verb aprire means to open. When you conjugate it, it changes according to the subject. Hai aperto la scatola means you open the box. Hanno aperto la scatola means they opened the box. Let's take a look at another example. Tornare means to return. Siamo tornati a casa in treno means we return home by train. Sono tornata a casa in treno means I return home by train. Can you see how the subject changes based on the way the verb is conjugated in the sentence? Okay, let's move on. Negating a sentence in Italian is incredibly simple. All you have to do is to put the word non in front of the verb. Let's go back to the original example, I ate an apple. The verb here is ate, or ho mangiato, in Italian. Ho mangiato una mela. To make this sentence negative, simply add non before the verb, ho mangiato. Non ho mangiato una mela. If it were Carla ate an apple, it would be Carla ha mangiato una mela. Adding non before the verb would make it negative. Carla non ha mangiato una mela. Siamo tornati a casa in treno. Non siamo tornati a casa in treno. You can create any negative sentence in Italian simply by adding non before the verb. Asking a question in Italian is even easier than making it negative. All you have to do is simply raise the pitch at the end of a sentence to turn it into a question. Hai aperto la scatola? Hai aperto la scatola? No rearranging of words is needed. Hai aperto la scatola? Hai aperto la scatola? You can create any basic yes-no questions in Italian this way. If you want to be a little more specific, simply add the question word in front of the question. For example, perché means why. Perché hai aperto la scatola? 
Quando means when. Quando hai aperto la scatola? And come means how. Come hai aperto la scatola? Now you know how to create questions in Italian. Well done! We've covered a lot of things in this lesson, so let's recap what we've learned. In this lesson, you learned that Italian sentences can be formed using a subject, verb, object, or SVO word order. Italian tends to omit the subject if that subject is a pronoun. You make a sentence negative by adding non before the verb. To turn a sentence into a question, simply raise your pitch at the end. And if you want to be more specific, just add a question word at the beginning of the question. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, can I also make profession names feminine? Italian nouns have a gender. This means some are masculine and some are feminine. Generally, you can change a masculine noun into a feminine one by changing the article and the final vowel. For example, il bambino, meaning the child, is masculine. La bambina is feminine. Since gender in Italian language is such an important grammar category, the answer to the question is yes. Most of the time, you can change profession names into feminine. Let's see how to do that. Profession ending in aio and iere change the ending to aia and iera. For example, fornaio, fornaia, baker, cameriere, cameriera, waiter, waitress. Professions ending in tore change the ending to trice. Attore, attrice, actor, actress. Profession ending in ista only change the article to specify the gender. Lo stilista, la stilista, the stylist. Il tassista, la tassista, the taxi driver. What about profession traditionally involving men? Society is constantly evolving and the language must keep up with the times. Today, more and more women are becoming lawyers, engineers, doctors, etc. Some of these titles have a regular feminine form in Italian, such as dottoressa, doctor, or direttrice, chief manager. But what about other titles that were almost never used for women in Italian history, like ministro, minister, or presidente, president? It is la ministro or la ministra, la presidentessa or la presidente. Some professions have the feminine version ending in essa, but this form is often considered ironic or even derogatory. For example, I'd be better to say l'avvocato instead of l'avvocatessa, lawyer, and la vigile instead of la vigilessa, traffic officer. In the same way, la presidentessa is perceived as politically incorrect. So, when you're referring to a woman, use the masculine version with a feminine article instead, la presidente. Besides, nouns ending in ente and ante don't change in the feminine form. For example, cantante, singer. So it's only natural that it should be la presidente. There are instances where the suffix essa doesn't have a negative undertone. So it's perfectly okay to say poetessa, poetess, and studentessa, student. As for ministro, the most common feminine version is il ministro, the minister. However, Lately, many people have argued that ignoring the gender of the woman who holds the title is politically incorrect as well. So, you may also hear to read la ministro. But this form is also incorrect. Masculine nouns change to feminine by changing the final o to a. Nobody would say la maestro instead of la maestra, the teacher. So the best way to call a female minister is actually la ministra. Professions that borrow English words only change the article. Il manager, la manager. Il designer, la designer. Il leader, la leader. One final thing. In colloquial Italian, when referring to a woman by her family name, 
it's common to add the feminine article la, the. For example, la rossi. Although this is something very common, it's politically incorrect because it highlights the gender of the person you're referring to only when the person is feminine. It's as if in English, when referring to a woman instead of just using her family name, like Smith, you said Smith the woman. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! See you soon! Hello! Welcome to Italian Weekly Words! And this is Ilaria. Let's see today's theme. Is... Oh... Hobbies. Hobby. And the first word is calligrafia. Calligraphy. Mi piacerebbe seguire un corso di calligrafia. I would like to go to a calligraphy class. By the way, my handwriting is very messy. I really need to go to a calligraphy class, maybe. And the next word is ballare. Dance. Ogni sabato vado a ballare. Every Saturday I go to dance. Do you like dancing? Next one. Ah, uh, this one I love. Suonare uno strumento musicale. Play a musical instrument. Io so suonare uno strumento musicale. I can play a musical instrument. That's true. I actually can play piano. And I started to study piano when I was seven. I decided. I just really want it so bad. Nice. Can you play anything? Let me know, huh? Next one. Disegnare. Draw. I love to draw. Ogni giorno disegno tre ore. Every day I draw for three hours. Not really, but I draw everywhere. In the train, when I have some time, I just draw. I love it. Navigare in internet. <laughs> Surf the net. Is this a hobby? <laughs> Prima di dormire, navigo in internet. Before going to bed, I surf the net. That's something really bad to do. Just go to bed immediately. Next one is the end. I hope you enjoyed the Italian weekly words and see you next time. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Hi, guys. Welcome to ItalianPod101.com. My name is Ilaria. Nice to meet you or nice to see you again. Today, we're going to talk about the top 10 most common tourist vocabulary. So, let's start. Biglietto. Ticket. Biglietto, ticket, vorrei due biglietti per gli uffizi, per favore. Two tickets for the uffizi gallery, please. This is actually, you can apply this phrase to pretty much everything when you need a ticket for something. So, uh, let's say, um, you want a ticket for a museum. Vorrei un biglietto per il museo, per favore. I would like a ticket for the museum, please. Vorrei un biglietto per il treno, per favore. I would like a ticket for the train, please, for example. So you can apply this to pretty much everything that you like. Turista. Tourist. Turista. Tourist. In Piazza della Signoria ci sono sempre centinaia di turisti. In Signoria Square, there are always a hundred of tourists. Itinerario. Itinerary. Itinerario. Itinerary. Abbiamo studiato un buon itinerario per visitare l'Italia del Sud. We planned a good itinerary to visit Southern Italy. You can also say, abbiamo preparato un itinerario per il nostro viaggio. We prepare an itinerary for our travel. Guida turistica. Guidebook. Guida turistica. Guidebook. Preferisco usare internet per consultare le guide turistiche in PDF. I prefer using the internet to read PDF of guidebooks. It's very interesting because you can actually um, print as well the guidebooks and take it to you uh, when you travel. And instead of maybe you know, buying proper guidebooks, you know, you can choose what you like to see. Uh, and so it's, it's a bit different. Autobus turistico. Tour bus. Autobus turistico. 
Turbas. Prenotando l'autobus turistico andremo ad Assisi e Perugia. By booking a tour bus, we'll go to Assisi and Perugia. You can also say, I mean, when you arrive to an airport, let's say, and you are looking for a tour bus or a tour bus services where in the city uh, where you're traveling in. So you can actually go to the tourist desk and say, c'è un tour bus. They can understand also if you say tour bus in Italian. But of course, if you say, uh, c'è un autobus turistico, is there a tour bus? You know, or uh, uh, c'è un servizio per i turisti? Is there a service for tourists with a bus? You know, so you can use a lot of different words. Tempio, tempo, tempio, tempo. Sto per andare a vedere i templi della Valle di Agrigento in Sicilia. I'm going to see the temples of Agrigento Valley in Sicily. I've never been there, but I know that they're really, really beautiful. So if you have time to go to, Cic to, to Agrigento when you visit Sicily, um, you can't miss this, this spot. It's really, really nice one. Uh, there is a lot of history there. Moschea, mosque. Moschea, mosque. Stanno inaugurando una nuova moschea nella nostra città. They are inaugurating a new mosque in our town. Chiesa, church, chiesa, church. I gruppi di turisti possono visitare le chiese quando non ci sono messe. Group of tourists can visit churches when there isn't mass. Cascata, waterfall, cascata, waterfall. Nel centro Italia c'è la splendida cascata delle marmore. In the central Italy, there is the wonderful marmore waterfall, and it's actually pretty spectacular too. Visitare, to visit. Visitare, to visit. Ci piace visitare i paesini del centro Italia. We love visiting the small towns in central Italy. We actually reached the end of our lesson, so thanks for listening. Please do not forget to subscribe, comment, we are here for you guys. So bye from italianpod101.com next time and always take care. Bye from Ilaria. Take care. Bye bye. Hi everyone, welcome to your monthly review, the monthly show on language learning, where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, new study tools, resources, and where we show off learners like you speaking the language. That is, if you're brave enough to become language learning famous. All the materials mentioned in this video are available for you now on our website. Click the link in the description to sign up for your free lifetime account and start speaking in minutes. Okay, today's topic is the 10 habits of highly effective language learners. So what do successful language learners, people who set language goals and actually hit them, do differently? And are you doing any of these things already? Let's get into it. You'll discover 10 powerful habits and how to apply them. I'll give you specific step-by-step -step examples. You can use these whether you're learning with our program or any other resource, a textbook, an app, or some audio program. Let's start with the first and most important one. Habit number one, set small, measurable goals with deadlines. Why small goals? Well, say for example, you set big, vague goals, like I wanna be fluent someday, and maybe you buy a textbook, you read the first chapter, then you start wondering if you're getting any better. You start worrying you'll never be fluent, and you give up. If you do this, you need to start setting small, measurable goals. For example, learn 100 words in a month, or speak one minute of conversation, or do 30 of our audio lessons in one month. Deadline, November 30th. Okay, habit number two, create a routine, because your routine is what will bring your goals to reality. This goes back to the first habit. Again, if you set a goal like doing 30 lessons in one month, you need to do one lesson a day and spend 15 minutes studying. Now you have a routine to stick to, one lesson a day, 15 minutes. Next, decide when and where you'll do it. Why? So you can make time. 
make a mental note that this time is language time. And this is important, say no to other things. Your language goals and dreams take first priority. Next, habit number three, don't cram. Instead of cramming or forcing yourself to learn for one or five hours, start small. Cramming may have worked for you with studying for tests, but language learning is a marathon, not a sprint. So if you do five hours now, you'll burn yourself out. You'll hate the learning, and that's not good. That's how you fail at your goals and dreams. But if you can do five to 15 minutes a day, every day, learning won't be overwhelming, and you'll be successful in the long run. So how do you create this habit? If you've set your small, measurable goal and routine, you're good to go. Habit number four, prepare lines and conversations ahead of time. If you're like most language learners, speaking is your weak point. And a lot of the time, it's because you just don't know what to say. You don't have the words in your head. This is where preparation comes in. So imagine you meet a person for the first time. What do you say to each other? Hello, how are you? What's your name? Where are you from? What are your hobbies? If you prepare these questions and answers ahead of time, you then have things to ask and say. So how do you do this? If you're learning on the website, check out our top 25 questions lessons that teach you questions and answers that we use all the time in conversations. For example, what's your name? Where are you from? How old are you? How was your weekend? Another way to prepare is to make a list of questions or phrases you want to say, then get the translations for those. The point is, if you prepare lines like, my name is, I am from, this weekend I did this, the kind of lines you use all the time, you'll always have something to say. Habit number five, get into the habit of producing output. So input is taking language in, listening and reading, and output is putting language out, so speaking and writing. The point here is, it's easy to just sit and listen and watch YouTube videos. You can listen to lessons all day long, but listening helps with listening. It won't get you speaking the language. So the easiest ways to produce output are, for speaking, repeat what you hear out loud. That's called shadowing. And for writing, write things out by hand. You can copy out our lesson dialogues or just copy the sentences out of a textbook. Habit number six, come back and review. And that's because reading something once doesn't mean it'll be in your brain forever. So this is where reviewing comes in. In order to master grammar, words, or phrases, you must go back and review. How do you do this? Spaced repetition flashcards are a great example of this. A lot of language learners use these because with spaced repetition, you get to see words again and again over spaced periods of time, and that improves your memory. Another simple thing you can do is download and save our lessons. Replay them later. Download our dialogue tracks. These give you just the conversation from that lesson, no translations. Make a playlist on your phone and listen as much as possible, just like with songs. Soon, you'll know tons of practical conversations by heart. Next, habit number seven, look for solutions. There's one interesting thing that separates new learners from successful learners. It's how they react when they don't understand something. Because beginners completely rely on the study tools they use, they tend to blame them too. You'll often hear that someone gave up because the textbook was too boring, or it won't help them speak. But if you realize a book won't help you speak, it's not the book's fault, is it? And if you complain that a class doesn't help you speak, but you're not raising your hand at every opportunity either, whose fault is it? So experienced learners look for solutions. Get into the habit of coming up with a solution for your problem. Habit number eight, focus on what you're good at. And you should do this because it's overall motivation. If you're generally better at speaking than writing, then you're more likely to enjoy it, which means you're more likely to continue with it. And that means it's a successful routine. Habit number nine is don't procrastinate, which is easier said than done. Most of us procrastinate. And a lot of that is a result of overthinking. Let's say you plan on studying today. So you remember, ah, I have to study, I have to study. Now you're ruining it in your head. It becomes something you have to do. It's a hassle now. But if you set a small, measurable goal and have a simple routine, spend five minutes, then you know you just need to put in five minutes and you're done. So if you want to beat procrastination, make your goals and routines easy. And number 10, remember that learning a language is a marathon, not a sprint. So there's no need to do five hour cram sessions and burn yourself out. Five or 10 minutes is good enough. Remembering this is a good habit to have. 
If you're having a bad day, if you can't remember some grammar, it's not all over. It's just a minor bump in the road. Another thing that helps is considering the resources you use. Sticking with quick five minute lessons that are easy to finish will help keep you in the marathon. Now, speaking of lessons and resources, here are this month's new lessons and resources. First, the Ultimate Guide to Learning and Mastering Language eBook. This is a 52 page eBook that covers the learning tactics I just talked about, setting goals, staying motivated, learning faster. If you're interested in learning strategies, be sure to download it. Next, the Sport and Exercise Conversation Cheat Sheet. If you wanna talk about sports and fitness in the language you're learning, then you'll love this PDF cheat sheet. And finally, how to improve your speaking skills. It's another language strategy lesson. To get these free lessons and resources, just click the link in the description below. All right, because this is the very first episode of the monthly review, we're asking you, yes you, to submit a video of yourself speaking the language. Here's the challenge for you. Yes, everyone watching this. Record a 30 second to one minute audio or video clip. Introduce yourself in the language. Share your name, where you're from, and why you're studying this language. And you'll win a three month premium plus subscription. To submit, click on the link in the description. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Then fill out the form, attach the audio or video file, and press submit. We may feature you in next month's episode, so a lot of learners will see you and your progress and will hopefully get inspired to improve and master the language. To submit a recording, click the link in the description and follow the instructions on the page. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Next time, we'll talk about why your worst days are the best days to study. In the meantime, submit your recording if you're brave. Like and share this video and leave a comment to tell us what language learning tactics you'd like us to talk about. See you next time. Bye. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, where should I put the adjective? Usually, descriptive adjectives in Italian are placed after the noun they modify. For example, la mela rossa, the red apple, il tavolo verde, the green table. However, sometimes you can put an adjective before the noun. There isn't a fixed rule for when you can invert the order, but here is a tip. The adjective put after the noun is the notative. The meaning is literal. The adjective put before the noun is connotative. The meaning is suggestive. Let's see some examples. Un calciatore grande can be translated as a big footballer. The meaning here is literal. The guy is tall and well set. Un grande calciatore means a great footballer. The meaning here is figurative. We don't know if the guy is short or tall. The important thing is he never misses a goal. Un vecchio amico and un amico vecchio are both translated as an old friend in English, but they are not the same. When vecchio is before the noun, it means long-standing. When it's after the noun, it means advanced in years. Here is another example. Ho visto un nuovo film. Here, nuovo has the same meaning as another. I've seen another movie. Ho visto un film nuovo. Here, nuovo is used in its literal meaning. I've seen a new movie. Sometimes the meaning doesn't change, regardless of where you put the adjective. For example, una bella poesia or una poesia bella both mean a beautiful poem. However, some adjectives always come after the noun. These include adjectives that specify color, shape, nationality, religion, category. Occhi azzurri, blue eyes. Una scatola quadrata, a square box. Un ragazzo americano, an American boy. Adjectives that come from the present participle, they end in ante or ente, or from the past participle, ending in uto, ato, ito. For example, Un essere vivente, a living being. Un sole abbagliante, a dazzling sun. Un libro bruciato, a burnt book.
un paese evoluto, a developed country. Adjectives modified by a suffix ino, etto, uccio, accio, etc. Un bambino piccolino, a tiny child, un colore giallastro, a yellowish color. Finally, here is something that may surprise you. English adjectives occur in a specific order, quantity, quality, size, age, and so on. In Italian, on the other hand, the order doesn't really matter when there is more than one adjective. So, if you want to say a beautiful, tall, young woman, you can say una donna bella, alta e giovane, or una donna giovane, alta e bella, or una donna alta, giovane e bella, and other combinations too. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon! To master a new language and understand everything as soon as you hear it, to read with just a quick glance and speak smoothly without thinking, you need to review. Here are our top five review tactics. Number one, listen to examples over and over again. By listening closely and often, you start to pick up the rhythm of a language, as well as correct pronunciation from a native speaker. Use our line-by-line -line feature that lets you both listen and read along. Use this tool to practice as much as possible. Number two, use our voice recording tool to master perfect pronunciation. Record yourself and compare it against the native speaker. If you sound different, then repeat after the native speaker until you're able to match them. Use our voice recording feature, which makes recording super easy. Number three, master your recorded conversations. Record conversations and go over them again and again. Master entire conversations and repeat them line by line. Use any of the dialogues available for download on our website. These come with transcripts of the entire conversation. Number four, use mobile devices to reinforce previously learned conversations. Constant review is the best way to progress in your language studies. Download the recorded dialogue to your mobile device and incorporate it into your music playlist. Quick reviews throughout the day effectively reinforce what you've learned. Number five, read with line-by-line -line notes. Read along with a native speaker to really master pronunciation and natural intonation. You should start slow at first, then slowly increase your speed. Your pronunciation will become more natural. You will also see that your ability to understand fluent speakers will greatly increase. You'll be able to improve your communication skills using these five simple review techniques. Increase your understanding of your target language. And remember, if you're interested in getting all these review tools, Sign up for your free lifetime account. No credit card required, and you'll get the best free online resources. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how can I use the pronoun ne? Ne is an Italian pronoun that takes the place of nouns so that we don't have to repeat the same words. These nouns can refer to people, places, or things. Let's take a look at how it can be used. First, ne can be used when replacing a noun introduced by di or any combination like del, della, and so on. In this case, it has a partitive meaning. It can be translated as any, some, of it, of them. For example, hai bisogno di soldi? Sì, si, ne ho bisogno. Do you need some money? Yes, I need some. Abbiamo del burro? No, non ne abbiamo. Do we have any butter? No, we don't have any of it. Ne can also replace nouns introduced by a number or an expression of quantity. Let's see some examples. Quante borse hai? Ne ho solo tre. How many purses do you have? I have only three. Vuoi dello zucchero nel caffè? Sì, ne vorrei due cucchiaini. Would you like some sugar in your coffee? Yes, I'd like two spoons. We also use ne to replace nouns phrases introduced by the preposition di. 
with specific verbs. Here are some examples. Parlare di, meaning to talk about. Let's see a sample sentence. You can say, domani parleremo del problema, meaning tomorrow we'll talk about the problem. If it's clear what you are going to talk about, you can use ne and say, domani ne parleremo. This means, we'll talk about it tomorrow. In this case, ne replaces the phrase del problema. Another similar case is accorgersi di, meaning to notice. You can either say, non mi sono accorto di questo errore, I didn't notice this mistake, or if it's clear what you're talking about, you can say, non me ne sono accorto, I didn't notice it. Now, let's see where to put this little word in a sentence. Usually, we position ne before the conjugated verb. For example, ne vuoi ancora? Would you like more? In negative statements, it's always between the negation non and the verb. Vuoi un altro bicchiere di spumante? No, non ne voglio. Do you want another glass of sparkling wine? No, I don't want. In addition, we can attach it to an infinitive or a gerund. Non voglio più berne, grazie. I don't want to drink anymore, thank you. Here we've put together the infinitive bere and ne, making berne. Here is an example with a gerund. Avendone bevuto troppo, ora non si sente bene. Having drunk too much, now he doesn't feel well. There are several rules, so at first try memorizing and actually using a few expressions with ne. You'll eventually get the hang of it. Start with these three. Che ne pensi? What do you think about it? Non ce n'è più. There is no more of it. Ne vuoi? Do you want some? They are pretty simple, right? If you have any more questions, please leave us a comment below. A presto. See you soon. Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com. You've decided to study a new language. So now what? Well, you want to become fluent fast, right? Here are the top five shortcuts to learning a language. Number one, create a study schedule and set some goals. Many language learners are unorganized. Creating a schedule allows you to free up time to study consistently. Goals give you motivation and something to strive for. Number two, make it fun. If you learn how to make your study time enjoyable, chances are you'll be more inclined to study. Watch a TV show with subtitles or listen to some music. Number three, find a language partner. This is the best way to improve your conversation skills. It will help you gain fluency even faster and increase confidence when speaking. Number four, use word lists to build up a solid vocabulary. This is a great way to build up your fluency, one word at a time. Luckily, we have all the word lists you need with a range of topics from food to love. Choose whichever language you want to study and go. Number five, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Nothing helps you improve more than correcting your own errors. You're more likely to remember it correctly the next time around. Everyone makes mistakes. Don't be afraid to learn from them. There's no magical way to learn a new language overnight, but doing all of these can really help your learning process. And remember, if you're interested in getting on the fast track to fluency, sign up for your free lifetime account, no credit card required, and you'll get the best free online resources. Start learning now. Hi guys, welcome to italianpod101.com. My name is Ilaria, nice to meet you. And today we're going to talk about the 20 travel phrases you should know. So something quite usual if it happens that, for instance, you're going to travel in my country, in Italy. So let's start. Potrei avere una mappa? Could I get a map? Potrei avere una mappa? Could I get a map? 
is actually something really useful, especially if you find yourself in a situation where you don't know where you are and you want to ask someone help. Let's say you're going to a local shop and you say, Potrei avere una mappa? Parla inglese? Do you speak English? Another useful phrase is, Parla inglese? Do you speak English? This is something really, really useful when you are abroad and, and you want to know if someone speaks English and you say, Parla inglese? C'è un autobus dall'aeroporto alla città? Is there a bus from the airport to the city? C'è un autobus dall'aeroporto alla città? Is there a bus from the airport to the city? This is specifically from the airport to the city. So, dall'aeroporto alla città, from the airport to the city. Dov'è la stazione? Where is the train station? Dov'è la stazione? Where is the train station? So in this case, uh, dov'è la stazione is a bit generic in Italian because you can say where is the train station, which is dov'è la stazione dei treni, but you can also say dov'è la, stra- dov'è la stazione del bus, where is the autobus station, you know. You should be like specific because people they might ask you which station are you looking for, train station or bus station, because they are quite different, sometimes they are in different places in Italy. Mi scusi, qual è la tariffa? Excuse me. What's the fare? Mi scusi, qual è la tariffa? Excuse me, what's the fare? You can also say, mi scusi, quanto costa? È questo l'autobus giusto per l'aeroporto? Is this the right bus for the airport? È questo l'autobus giusto per l'aeroporto? Is this the right bus for the airport? You can also say this with trains, with any kind of public transport really, you know? And also, è questo il treno giusto per l'aeroporto? La connessione wifi è gratuita? Is the Wi-Fi free? La connessione Wi-Fi è gratuita? Is the Wi-Fi free? Then you can check your maps, you know, watch for public transport yourself, you know. Uh, you can also say, avete Wi-Fi? Which is actually pretty much the same, they will understand what you're talking about. Ha qualche posto libero per stasera? Do you have any vacancies tonight? Ha qualche posto libero per stasera? Do you have any vacancies tonight? In this case, you are talking about hotel rooms or, uh, you know, any kind of uh, place where you can spend the night, where you are abroad as, a, as an hotel or a B&B or an apartment, you know. And you can actually say, avete qualche posto libero? Potrei spostarmi in una camera diversa? Could I move to a different room? Potrei spostarmi in una camera diversa? Could I move to a different room? So let's say you, you just find an auto, but they give you like a, a, a very small room and you need more things and you can just say, avete un'altra camera? You know, they will understand that you want to change your room, basically. Ho prenotato. I have a reservation. Ho prenotato. I have a reservation. So basically when you say ho prenotato means that you have booked. Potremmo avere il menu, per favore? Could we have the menu, please? So this is about the food. In English you say, could we have the menu, please? And so in Italian you say, potremmo avere il menu, per favore? Potremmo, if you are like loads of people, but if you are by yourself, you say, potrei avere il menu, per favore? And they will understand exactly what you're talking about. Potrei avere il conto? Could I have the check? Potrei avere il conto? Could I have the check? The check is the bill. You finish to eat and you want to know how much your, 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 the, the amount, I mean, uh, that you have to pay for. So you say, potrei avere il conto, per favore? Sono allergico alle arachidi. I am allergic to peanuts. Sono allergico alle arachidi. I am allergic to peanuts. This is very important, especially if you're allergic to some food, to avoid any problems when you are around for your holidays, you know? And this is actually a very good example when you say, sono allergico. Allergico means that you have an allergy, so you are not able to get this food. So, sono allergico alle arachidi. Sono allergico al gluten, which means like, I'm allergic to gluten, for instance, you know? And so on. Acqua, per favore. Water, please. Acqua, per favore. Water, please. Quanto costa? How much is this? Quanto costa? How much is this? Also, you can say, mi potrebbe dire quanto costa, per favore, which means like, could I, could I know how much is that, please, you know? Ne vorrei dieci di questi. I'd like ten of these. 
ne vorrei 10 di questi. I'd like 10 of these, which is like, um, let's say you, 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 you saw something and you want to know just the quantity, you want more than one, you know, and you say, ne vorrei, ne vorrei uno, like I want one, ne vorrei due, I want two, and so on, you know, and let's say in this case, it's, ne vorrei dieci. Vorrei questo. I'd like this. Vorrei questo. There is just one particular thing that just grab your attention and you say, I want this. Vorrei questo. Potrebbe farmi uno sconto? Could you give me a discount? Potrebbe farmi uno sconto? Could you give me a discount? So this is quite important, especially if you, if you get around quite often and you want to have discounts on things. Let's say you, wanna buy, you, you buy like a bunch of things and you want a, a discount from the seller and you say, posso avere lo sconto per favore? Accettate le carte di credito? Do you take credit card? Accettate la carta di credito? Do you take credit card? Potrebbe farmi una foto per favore? Could you take a picture of me please? Potrebbe farmi una foto per favore? Could you take a picture of me, please? That might be happening, you know, you are in front of a very important monument and you want someone to make a photo of you. And then you say, potrebbe farmi una foto, per favore? With this nice question, we actually reached the end of our lesson, guys. Thanks very much for uh, listening to us, as usual. Please watch us, comment, subscribe, and give us some tips about what you want to know next in our lovely Italian language. From italianpod101.com, that's it. Thanks very much for listening, and take care. Bye-bye. Have a nice day, guys. Bye-bye. Today, we're going to talk about four techniques to help you stop translating in your head and instead start thinking in your target language. This will allow you to have conversations with ease, read smoothly, and better understand native speakers. These are four methods to help you think in a new language. Number one, surround yourself with your target language. This way, you'll be completely immersed in the language. Without realizing it, you'll learn pronunciation, sentence structures, grammar, and new vocabulary. Play music in the background while you're cooking, or have a radio station on while you study. Just use one of our endless podcasts available to you. These are easy to listen to in the background while doing other things. Number two, learn through observation. This is how we all learned our native languages as kids. Words will develop their own meanings that relate better to your target language, rather than meanings that are translated directly. Number three, speak out loud to yourself. Even if you're a little embarrassed, it forces you to listen to how you speak. It makes it much easier to spot simple grammar mistakes. Number four, practice daily. If you practice everything for only one day, you won't retain the information you learned. The brain can realistically only focus for about 30 minutes. So studying a little every day allows you to absorb better. Follow these steps and have patience. You'll soon be able to achieve your language learning goals. Just make sure to remember these four methods. Sign up for your free lifetime account. No credit card required, and you'll get the best free online resources. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how can I correctly conjugate the adjective bello? Bello is a very common Italian adjective that means beautiful or good. Despite being common, it's irregular and doesn't follow the regular forms of adjectives. It follows the article rules instead. Let's see all the forms it can take. Just like the masculine article lo, it's bello before a masculine noun starting with Z, X, P, S, P, N, G, N, Y, S plus consonant. For example, bello zaino, beautiful backpack, bello spettacolo, good show. The adjective becomes bel with an apostrophe before a masculine noun starting with a vowel. For example, belluomo, beautiful man. S, G is a plural form for lo and l apostrophe. With an apostrophe similar, belli is the plural form of bello and bel. Belli zaini, beautiful backpacks. Belli uomini, beautiful men. It's bel before all other masculine nouns. 
which would take the masculine article il. For example, bel gatto, beautiful cat. Just like i is the plural form of il, similarity bei is the plural form of bel, bei gatti, beautiful cats. It's bella before all feminine nouns, which would take the feminine article la. For example, bella donna, beautiful woman, bella isola, beautiful island. An exception is bella amica, meaning good friend, in an ironic way. Just like le is the plural form of la, belle is the plural feminine form. Belle donne, beautiful woman. Belle isole, beautiful islands. The demonstrative adjective quello, that, follows the same rules as bello, and it rhymes. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon. Hey everyone, welcome to your monthly review the monthly show on language learning, where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, new study tools, resources, and where we show off learners like you speaking the language. That is, if you're brave enough to participate and become language learning famous. All the materials mentioned in this video are available for you right now on our website. Click the link in the description to sign up for your free lifetime account and start speaking in minutes. Okay, today's topic is why your worst days are the best days to study. So, have you ever had a day where you planned on learning language and you just couldn't go through with it? Even if learning a new language is your personal goal, something that you really want? Well, today you're going to learn, one, why these bad days happen, and two, why you'll get your best work done on your worst days. Let's start, why bad days happen with language learning. When I say bad days, I don't mean when you're too busy or when life gets in the way. These things are unavoidable. I mean days when you're just not in the mood. It's a perfectly good day. The sun is shining. No bad news. But you just can't get yourself to study. You're just wasting the day. So here's why they happen. First, it's the law of diminishing returns in action. What does this mean? Think of it as eating pizza every day for five days a week. On the first day, the first two slices are great, but by the third one, you're feeling queasy. It's not as good. And by the fifth day, you're sick of pizza. That's the law of diminishing returns, when the benefits start decreasing over time. And it happens with language learning. When you first start, you learn a lot of phrases and it feels good, you're excited. But as time goes on, you don't feel like you're learning much. And this affects your mood and motivation, so you're not as excited to learn anymore so you start having bad days. Second, bad days happen because you overthink things and ruin it for yourself. It's like dreading going to the gym. Let's say you went yesterday, you have to go again today. So you're dreading it all day long. Ah, I gotta go again. You set yourself up for a bad mood and a bad day. Third, bad days are a natural part of the cycle. Some days will be good. Most days you'll feel indifferent. Some days will be bad. But that's completely natural, and anyone with long-term projects and goals feels the same. And fourth, you can't be on 100% of the time. So just like days can't always be good, you too can't always be on and ready to go all the time. Again, just a realistic and expected part of the journey. Now, let's jump into the second part, why you'll get your best work done on your worst days. So, why will you get your best work done? First, it's not that bad once you start. Once you've spent 10 or 15 minutes learning a language, it's not so bad. People say the same thing about the gym. If you show up and put in a bit of time, it gets easier. Second, it's overcoming a mental barrier. What I mean is, when most of us have bad days, our brain automatically says, okay, can't be done today, stop, we're done. But if you just work through it, you don't take these bad days so seriously anymore. And that means you're more likely to stick with your language learning goal. This brings us to the next point. Third, it's your best work because working on a bad day only strengthens your habit of language learning. Remember, habits are what will help you master a language over time. If you can stick to a habit on a bad day, your habit only gets stronger and it will lead you to fluency. And finally, fourth, it just feels good to overcome something. Imagine you have a bad day, but you still put in 10 minutes of language learning. It's a real sense of achievement. 
and it doesn't matter if you do a 10 minute lesson or a five minute lesson. The fact that you made some progress on a bad day will give you the motivation you need to keep going. Now, speaking of lessons, here are this month's new lessons and resources. First, the best of 2018 language learning cheat sheets. If you want to get access to all of our conversation cheat sheets that we sent out this year, here's your chance. Download this PDF bundle right now. Next, the brand new supermarket cheat sheet. With this cheat sheet, you'll learn must know shopping phrases and vocab for meats, vegetables, and all products that you'll find in a supermarket. And finally, the most common adjectives. If you're a beginner and don't yet know these adjectives, then this is a perfect chance to boost your vocabulary. This one minute lesson will get them stuck in your head, guaranteed. To get these free lessons and resources, just click the link in the description below. All right, everyone. Now we're asking you to submit a video or audio file of yourself speaking the language. If you do, you'll win three free months of access to our learning program, which includes your very own teacher. Here's the challenge for you. Yes, everyone watching this. Record a 30 second to one minute video or audio clip. Introduce yourself in the language. Share your name, where you're from, and why you're studying this language. And you'll win a three month premium plus subscription. To submit, click on the link in the description. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Then fill out the form, attach the audio or video file, and press submit. We may feature you in next month's episode. So a lot of learners will see you and your progress and will hopefully get inspired to improve and master the language. To submit a recording, click the link in the description and follow the instructions on the page. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Next time, we'll talk about how to set achievable language learning goals and resolutions. In the meantime, submit your recording if you're brave. Like and share this video and leave a comment to tell us what language learning tactics you'd like us to talk about. See you next time. Bye. Hi, guys. Welcome to ItalianPod101.com. My name is Ilaria. Nice to meet you or nice to see you again. Today, we're going to talk about the 15 must know family words, of course, in Italian. So let's start. Famiglia. Family. Famiglia. Family. Ho una famiglia numerosa, tipicamente italiana. I have a typical big Italian family. So, as you know, Italian families are quite big, you know, and you actually notice this when they get along together during Christmas time or, you know, very special times and you can see like 30, 40, 50 people together. So, it's very nice. Padre. Father. Padre. Father. Mio padre ha 60 anni. My father is 60 years old. Well, actually, my, my dad is a bit um, younger than that. He's like 57 years old. <laughs> Marito. Husband. Marito. Husband. Suo marito è davvero simpatico. Her husband is really funny. You can also say... Um, suo marito è davvero gentile. Your husband is really kind. Figlio. Son. Figlio. Son. Mio figlio ha appena compiuto 18 anni. È un adulto. My son has just turned 18. Is an adult. Because, you know, 18 years old is... Um, when you basically, uh, you can get your driving license, you are like, you are an adult in a way that you can get different kind of responsibilities. Uh, and in Italy is the, um, when you get like 18 years old. Fratello. Brother. Fratello. Brother. Ho chiamato mio fratello per organizzare una festa sorpresa per papà. I call my brother to organize a surprise party for my dad. Zio. Anco. Zio. Anco. Lo zio paterno è il fratello di tuo padre. A paternal uncle is the brother of your father. Nonno. Grandfather. Nonno. Grandfather.
nostro nonno vuole ancora guidare l'auto. Our grandfather still wants to drive the car. Suocero. Father in law. Suocero. Father in law. Suo suocero è molto gentile con tutti. A father in law is nice to everybody. Madre. Mother. Madre. Mother. Mia madre sta frequentando un corso di yoga. My mother is taking yoga lessons. Well, actually, my mom, she does take tai chi lessons. So. <laughs> Mia madre sta frequentando un corso di tai chi. Figlia. Daughter. Figlia. Daughter. Dovreste dire a vostra figlia che deve studiare di più. You should say to your daughter that she should study more. This is something that if you go, you know, if you got someone, I mean, a daughter or a son going to school, you know, it can happen that maybe professors, they come and they say uh, that your daughter or your son needs to study more. So in the case is a daughter, so you say, uh, sua figlia dovrebbe studiare di più. And the male version, like for a son, is suo figlio dovrebbe studiare di più. Sorella. Sister. Sorella. Sister. Tra sorelle ci si capisce subito. Sisters understand each other quickly. Moglie. Wife. Moglie. Wife. Sua moglie non è felice del suo nuovo lavoro. His wife is not happy about his new job. If she's happy, you say, sua moglie è felice per il nuovo lavoro. So, your wife is happy for the new job. Suocera. Mother-in-law. Suocera. Mother-in-law. La suocera è sempre pronta a giudicare. The mother-in-law is always ready to judge. This is, I think, a common thing all over the world. This is not my case, really, but, you know, uh, this is just very common. This is what, you know, mother-in-law, they usually do. Nonna. Grandmother. Nonna. Grandmother. La loro nonna sa preparare delle torte buonissime. Their grandmother can bake delicious cakes. And by the way, I really love cakes. <laughs> Compagno. Partner. Compagno. Partner. Vivo da tre anni con il mio compagno. It's been three years since I started living with my partner. Thanks very much for listening. Please subscribe, comment, tell us what you want to hear in Italian language. So we actually reached the end of our lesson. And I thank you very much as usual for listening to us. Keep in touch. Take care always, guys. Bye bye. Want to speed up your language learning? Get access to all of our best PDF cheat sheets for free. Just click the link in the description and sign up for your free lifetime account right now. In this series, you'll master Italian pronunciation. Proper pronunciation is essential in Italian, and in this series, you'll learn it in a fast, comprehensive, and easy way. In this first lesson, you'll learn about the building blocks of the Italian pronunciation system that will help you in future lessons. The letters used in Italian are the same as the letters you use in English, with only the exception of a few accents on some of the letters. But be careful not to fall into a very common trap. As you're learning to speak correctly, you shouldn't concern yourself with all the letters. That's right, forget them. You care about the sounds of Italian, and here they are. There are 24 consonant sounds and seven vowel sounds. You can form every single word in Italian by using these sounds. Still seem complicated? Well, how about this? Of the 24 consonant sounds in Italian, you already know 19 of them. That's right. If you're a native English speaker, then you already make these sounds every day. You can also ignore five of the vowel sounds for the same reason. The only things standing between you and perfect Italian pronunciation are five new consonant and two new vowel sounds. You can handle that. Now let me introduce Desiree, who will be helping you to master these new sounds. Ciao, sono Desiree. Desiree will be giving you native pronunciation examples for you to imitate. But for this first lesson, just sit back and listen to the unique sounds of Italian. Zaino. Maglia. Gnocco. Torta. Indirizzo. 
Vero? Come? In the next lesson, we'll look at the top five pronunciation mistakes Italian learners make. You'll want to make sure not to fall into these common traps. After that, we'll begin going through the vowels and consonants of Italian. This is your chance to learn how to correctly say all of the words you just heard. We'll finish up the series by covering some special topics that will really make your Italian sound natural. To close this lesson, here's a question for you. Why is it important to spend time on learning proper pronunciation, even if you're already an advanced speaker? The answer, you will be understood. And this will help you build more confidence as you communicate in Italian. For beginners, you're creating a strong foundation to build on. And for more advanced students, this is your chance to improve your accent and lose any bad habits you may have picked up. In this lesson, you'll learn the top five Italian pronunciation mistakes to avoid. These are common mistakes that Italian learners tend to make. So pay close attention and make sure that you don't make these same mistakes too. Are you ready? Then let's get started. Number one, not enunciating the vowels enough. Italian pronunciation is based on syllables where vowel sounds are predominant. Many students of Italian do not enunciate the vowel sounds enough, which makes their pronunciation sound unnatural. To correct this, you should try to open your mouth and let the air pour out, pronouncing each and every syllable clearly. Pay attention to the way Desiree enunciates the vowel sound in each syllable and try to imitate her. Listen to the example. Roma. Barone. Buongiorno. Number two, shortening double consonant sounds. This is a common mistake because many students aren't aware that double consonants are actually pronounced for a longer duration in Italian than they are in English. To solve this problem, Try to lengthen the sound a little bit longer than you would in English. In the following examples, pay attention to the duration that the double consonant sound is held for and try to imitate it for yourself. Motto. Valle. Spesso. Number three, not pronouncing rolled R's correctly. R. This is arguably the most difficult sound for Italian learners to pronounce correctly. It's quite a complex sound, and in fact, it's one of the last sounds that Italian children learn how to pronounce. The only way to solve this problem is to keep listening to native Italian speakers and practicing it yourself, or practicing with us. Listen to the following examples. Tre. Parco. Radio. Frigorifero. We'll learn more about this sound in lesson seven. Number four mispronouncing the G and L sounds together. This is another sound that's difficult for Italian learners to pronounce. Gli. Yeah. It's a peculiar sound because it sounds somewhat like an English L, but not exactly. The problem arises when speakers begin substituting the regular L for this sound. Listen to Desiree and pay attention to the way it's pronounced in the following words. Maglia. Meglio. Aglio. Don't worry if you don't get it straight away because we'll break down this sound in lesson six. Number five, mispronouncing the C and I sounds together. Chi. This sound is identical to the ch in church. The only difference though is that it's stressed even more in Italian than it is in English. Listen to the example. Cucina. Lucia. Notice how the ch sound is more stressed in Italian than it is in English? Be mindful about pronouncing the ch sound when speaking in Italian. Now you know the top five Italian pronunciation mistakes to avoid. Try to be careful so that you don't commit these same mistakes. Still feel a bit worried? Over the rest of this series, we'll cover all of these topics in depth. In this lesson, you'll learn all seven Italian vowel sounds. Ah. E. Eh. E, I, O, O, U. With these sounds, you can pronounce any vowel that could possibly appear in Italian. Some vowels may be hard for you to distinguish, especially for English speakers, so make sure you listen carefully. Are you ready? Then let's get started. The first vowel is A, Sara, Casa. Alto. It's identical to the A sound in the word father, except that it's held for a little longer. Open your mouth wide and let the air pour out. 
a a a a the next vowel is e bene cioè elica it's identical to the e sound in the word red this is an open sound so be sure to widen your mouth e e e e the next vowel is e vero inglese stelle it's very similar to the e sound in the word ne drop your jaw just a tiny tiny bit until you hear a slight change in sound but be careful not to widen your mouth too much this will prevent you from carrying over the i sound and will allow you to properly pronounce the sound e e e Eh. The next vowel is I. Imposta. Colibri. Bile. It's identical to the double E sound in the word C. I. 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 The next vowel is O. Parola. Posso. Otto. It's identical to the OU sound in the word ot. This is an open sound, so be sure to widen your mouth. O. 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 Oh. The next vowel is O. Oh. Ombra. Come. Foro. This is like the previous sound, except your tongue is positioned a little bit higher. It's quite similar to the O sound in the word O. Oh. Just make sure not to widen your mouth too much. You only want to carry over the W sound slightly. Listen to Desiree. O. Oh. O. 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 And the last vowel is U. Tutto. Tuo. Ultimo. It's identical to the double O sound in the word boot. U. 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 Well done! You just learned all seven vowel sounds in Italian. A. E. E. I. O. O. U. With these sounds, you can properly pronounce any vowel that could possibly appear in the Italian language. Isn't that great? Want to get cheat sheets, audiobooks, lessons, apps, and much more every month for free? Just click the link in the description to get your free language gifts of the month. Hi, welcome to Introduction to Italian. My name is Alicia, and I'm joined by... Hi everyone, I'm Marika. In this lesson, you'll learn the basics of Italian pronunciation. Italian is what is called a syllable-timed language. What this simply means is that every syllable is pronounced for roughly an equal amount of time. Avranno. Avranno. Notice how each syllable is pronounced for roughly the same amount of time? The first N is held for roughly the same amount of time as all the other syllables. Avranno. English, on the other hand, is a stress-timed language. Unstressed syllables are often shortened, while stressed syllables are pronounced longer. 
Opportunity. Opportunity. The stress syllable to in opportunity is pronounced longer than all the other syllables. Listen to it again. Opportunity. Compare this once again to the syllables in Italian. Avranno. Even though Italian is not a stress-timed language, individual words still have primary stress. In most Italian words, the stress falls on the second to last syllable, so you'll need to pronounce this a tiny tiny bit longer and louder than the other syllables, but not by much. Avranno. Buongiorno. Apart from the stressed syllable, all other syllables are pronounced for roughly an equal amount of time. One of the biggest differences between English and Italian pronunciation is that Italian is largely phonetic, meaning most words are pronounced as they are written. This makes learning Italian much simpler than learning English, for example. For the most part, English and Italian share the same consonant and vowel sounds. I, U, B, D, F, M. In fact, 75% of all sounds in Italian are similar to English, so most of these sounds will be familiar to you. Some sounds, however, will be quite new. The good news, though, is that these will be very limited. E, E, Z, Y. Let's briefly take a look at some of the unique sounds of Italian. First, let's start with the vowels. There are five vowels in Italian. A, E, I, O, and U. The vowels A, I, and U will always be pronounced in the same way. A, I, U. These sounds should be relatively easy for you to duplicate. The vowels E and O, however, will be a little more challenging. They each have two variant sounds, one open version and one closed version. The open version requires you to open your mouth wide, while the closed version is pronounced more narrowly. Compare the open E followed by a closed E. E, 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 E. Now the open O followed by the closed O. O, 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 O. Even when there are two or more vowels in a row, just pronounce them separately. Aereo. Okay, now let's move on to the consonants. How would you pronounce this word in Italian? Spaghetti. Spaghetti. Despite not knowing Italian pronunciation, the chances are that your pronunciations of the S, P, and G consonants were spot on. Most consonants you encounter shouldn't be too difficult for you to pronounce. Some consonants, like the rolled R sound in Italian, however, will be more challenging. Do you remember how to pronounce this word? We taught you this word in the previous lesson. It's pronounced grazie. This word uses the rolled R sound. Grazie. To pronounce this sound, place the tip of your tongue on the gum ridge behind your upper teeth, just like you do when you want to say the English D sound. Then relax your tongue and blow out air. R Concentrate the air pressure at the tip of your tongue and gum ridge. The air will push your tongue away from the gum ridge. When this happens, try to force your tongue back into position. This should all happen very quickly. R One useful trick is to flip your tongue up and back against the gum ridge the very moment you feel the air begin to push through. R R Grazie. Grazie. Well done. This is a challenging sound, so don't be too hard on yourself if you didn't get it. Another significant aspect of Italian pronunciation is the pronunciation of double consonants. Unlike English, double consonants must be pronounced clearly and held for longer periods of time in Italian. Failure to do so could result in miscommunication. Pala, palla. Remember how Italian is a syllable-timed language? Imagine that you're holding that consonant sound for one extra syllable. Palla, palla. Many learners do not hold the sound for long enough, so when in doubt, pronounce it a little longer than you would normally. Okay, let's recap what we've learned in this lesson. In this lesson, you learned that Italian is a syllable-timed language, where syllables are pronounced for roughly an equal amount of time. Italian pronunciation is very regular, so most words are pronounced as they're spelled. 
Collectively, nearly all sounds in Italian are identical to English, and there are only a hand the 10 hardest words to pronounce. I hope I can manage somehow. Aiuto. Help. Aiuto. Help. This is a really helpful word because you can ask for help. For example, aiuto, sono chiuso dentro al bagno. Help, I'm locked inside the bathroom. You're not dying and you don't need help quickly. You just want to ask if people can help you. That would be aiutare. Puoi aiutarmi, per favore? Can you help me, please? Chiacchierare. Chat. Chiacchierare. Chat. The most common error mistake would be chiacchierare instead of chiacchierare. Cinque. Five. Cinque. Five. In one hand, there are five fingers. Ci sono cinque dita in una mano. Uno, due, tre, quattro, cinque. Ghiaccio. Ice. Ghiaccio. Ice. Be careful because if you don't pronounce G as a hard sound like G, it would be giaccio, that it's a verb and means lie down. Vuoi del ghiaccio nel tuo drink? Do you want some ice in your drink? A word that you can hear a lot, especially in summer, is ghiacciolo. It's an ice stick. I eat them a lot because it's so hot and some ice, flavored ice, it's great. Già, already. Già, already. Già has two meanings. First one, already. Sono già le sette. It's, it's seven already. To express consent would be like, oggi fa proprio caldo. Today is really hot. Già, yeah, really, indeed. Another example would be, hai già finito? Did you finish already? Lasciare, leave. Lasciare, leave. I left my key on the table. Ho lasciato le mie chiavi sul tavolo. Yeah, another meaning would be break up. For example, I don't want to break up with my boyfriend. Non voglio lasciare il mio ragazzo. When I go jogging, I leave my wallet home. Quando vado a correre, quando vado a jogging, lascio il portafogli a casa. Quando vado a correre, lascio il portafogli a casa. Pesca. Peach. Pesca. Peach. Yeah, for example, I ate a peach. Ho mangiato una pesca. Il tè alla pesca è il mio preferito. Peach tea is my favorite. Pesca. Fishing. Pesca. Fishing. Pesca. Pesca. You don't open your mouth like pesca, but pesca. And this one is the hobby you can have, for example. I really enjoy going fishing. Mi piace molto andare a pesca. So the difference would be pesca and pesca. Mangio pesce più volentieri che andare a pesca. I enjoy eating fish more than fishing. Segno. Sign. Mark. Stain. Signal. Here the difficult is probably the sound ñ that you can practice with gnomo, for example, that it's elf, gnom. Hai lasciato il segno. You really left the mark, you really impressed them. It's something that you would say. Yeah, segno has many meanings in, in English. Un segno sul muro, a stain on the wall. Give me a signal, fammi un segno. Be careful not to say segno, but segno because there is no I. And basically, in Italian, there is no word with both I and O after ñ. That was the last of our 10 hardest words to pronounce. I hope I was able to give you some advice. If you still have questions or if you still have words that you're not sure about how to pronounce, please write it down and remember to subscribe. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye. Let's go. Grande. Big. My hand is big. La mia mano è grande. The word is big. It's a big, big word. Il mondo è grande. Molto, molto grande. Anno. Year. Anno means year, and you can use it to ask how old are you, so quanti anni hai. Dire. To say. About dire, there is a fun phrase that we use, or maybe our grandmas, anyway, and it goes like, tra il dire e il fare c'è di mezzo il mare. That means, from saying to doing, there's the sea in between. So the 
Meaning is, it's not so easy to go from saying to doing things. Primo, first, I was the first in my class. Ero la prima nella mia classe. And that's why I didn't have friends. No, it's not true. <laughs> ultimo, last. As the English last but not least, in Italian we have ultimo ma non meno importante. That means but not less important. Remember, last ones will be the first ones. Gli ultimi saranno i primi. Come stai? How are you? Come stai? That means how are you? But it's something that you use with your friends, not really with people that you don't know, because in that case it would be something like come sta? Bene, grazie. E tu? I'm fine, thanks. And you? Bene, grazie. E tu? That means fine, thanks. And you? Figlia. Daughter. Figlia. Daughter. Dovreste dire a vostra figlia che deve studiare di più. You should say to your daughter that she should study more. This is something that if you go, you know, if you got someone, I mean, a daughter or a son going to school, you know, it can happen that maybe professors, they come and they say uh, that your daughter or your son needs to study more. So in the case is a daughter, so you say, uh, sua figlia dovrebbe studiare di più. And the male version, like for a son, is suo figlio dovrebbe studiare di più. Sedia a sdraio. Beach chair. Sedia a sdraio. Beach chair. Affittare le sedie a sdraio in agosto può essere abbastanza costoso. Renting beach chairs in August may be quite expensive. And this is actually a truth because everyone in Italy, I mean, most of the people in Italy goes on the, on, in, on holidays in August, you know. So, uh, and that's the, the main period where um, everything is more expensive if you go. Um, so it's just a general, gener very generic um, circumstance. Andare, to go. So in case you really, really want to go to the sea, you can say, voglio andare al mare, vieni con me. I want to go to the sea. Do you want to come with me? In my case, it would be, I would really like to go to Australia. Do you want to come with me? Voglio veramente andare in Australia. Vuoi venire con me? Sì. Yes. Sì, that means yes. Of course, it's really useful because... Vuoi mangiare qualcosa? Would you like something to eat? Sì. Yes. No. No. And if you manage to say no, because it's hard to say no to an Italian offering you some food, then you can say no. But it's the same, Italian and English, no. Abbronzatura, tan. Abbronzatura, tan. Prendere l'abbronzatura usando la crema solare è possibile. Getting a sun tan while using a sunscreen is possible. And I'm, I'm, I'm adding, not just possible, you should do it all the time because it's quite, um, you, if you don't use any sun uh, protection, um, it's quite dangerous for your skin uh, because of the UV ray and, um, and, and, and that, that's the main reason basically, but you should anyway, it's very important. Nuovo, new. Oh, you got a new car. Oh, I una macchina nuova. How much do you pay that? Quanto l'hai pagata? I would really like a new laptop, un computer nuovo. But yeah, maybe for Christmas. And after Christmas you can say Happy New Year, Felice Anno Nuovo. Momento, moment. Momento means moment, so can you wait a moment please? Puoi aspettare un momento per favore? Sentire, to hear. Like I can hear people screaming, sento gente urlare. But it's not the same as saying listening to music, for example, that would be ascoltare la musica. Lasciare, to leave. Leave a comment, so lasciare un commento. Also, there are some teenagers that say a lot of time, lasciatemi il mio spazio, <laughs> that means leave my space. Cappellino, hat, cap. Cappellino, hat, cap. Mettere il cappellino sulla testa dei bambini in spiaggia è importante. Putting a hat on the head of children at the beach is very important. Why? Because children are definitely more uh, delicate and fragile than adults. So everyone should use a cap or some protection, but uh, a particular attention should be uh, for, uh, for the kids, for the youngest. 
gelato. Ice cream. Gelato. Ice cream. In Italia i gelati alla frutta sono davvero deliziosi. In Italy, fruit ice creams are very delicious. I love ice cream. I mean, this is Italian ice creams are amazing, really. So if you love ice cream, you, you should just try uh, Italian ice cream if you go uh, holiday in my, in, my, in, my, uh, in my place, you know. Vorrei qualcosa da mangiare. I would like something to eat. When you need something, you can use the word vorrei, that means I would like to. So, vorrei mangiare, I would like to eat. Vorrei bere, I would like to drink. Vorrei dormire, I would like to sleep. Uh, we can go on forever, but still, vorrei, and then add the verb that you need. Posso avere il conto? Can I get the check? When you finish to eat and you want to check, you can say, posso avere il conto? That means, can I have the check? And if you want to be more polite, you can say, posso avere il conto, per favore? That means, can I have the check, please? A presto. See you soon. When you say bye to your friends and you don't really know when you're gonna meet them again, you will say a presto, that means see you soon. A dopo. See you later. If you know that you're gonna meet them later on, you can say a dopo, that means see you later. Dove posso mangiare la pizza? That means where can I eat a pizza? If you really no want to know where you can eat a good pizza, you can add buon, that means good, So it will be, dove posso mangiare una buona pizza? Of course, you cannot use pizza, but another type of food that you really want to eat, and that would be maybe lasagna or maybe gelato. So you can say, dove posso mangiare un buon gelato? Or, dove posso mangiare una buona lasagna? We learned how to ask, how are you? And to answer, I'm fine, thanks. But what about if you're not really fine? So you can say, così così, that means more or less, or male, that means bad, really bad. Want to speed up your language learning? Get access to all of our best PDF cheat sheets for free. Just click the link in the description and sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Welcome to ItalianPod101.com. My name is Ilaria. Nice to meet you, or nice to see you again. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, a very easy topic, something that you must learn if you are going to Italy, which is the top 10 ways to say hello. So let's start. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Good morning. You can also say uh, salve. Salve uh, is a more generic word that you can use with um, at any, really any, uh, any time of the day uh, and it's quite generic. So salve is something that is very polite and at the same time you can use it all the time during the day. So when you meet someone, let's say you say salve, so uh, the person is going to say to you salve or buongiorno. Ciao, hello, ciao is, well, I think um, everyone knows the word ciao, you know. Um, ciao is quite informal, so you don't say really ciao 
to older people or uh, the people that you don't know that you don't know really so um you can use chow with your friends uh but also let's say if you're going to a restaurant or a shop and you want to say to the uh to the person which is working um grazie ciao thanks goodbye you know it works you know because ciao you can use ciao as a hello when you meet someone but also as goodbye you know so is another very generic word as salve non ci vediamo da tanto tempo non ci vediamo da tanto tempo long time no see non ci vediamo da tanto tempo non ci vediamo da tanto tempo which in english is long time no see you can also say da quanto tempo non ci vediamo so it's a very long time that we haven't seen each other come ti sei trovato come ti sei trovato how have you been which is also you can say um come è andata come è andata which is pretty much the same you can use it uh let's say your friend go, goes to um your italian friend goes to uh somewhere for vacation and you want to ask him uh how the trip was and you you can say come è andata uh which is come ti sei trovato how have you been it's pretty much the same come va oggi how is your day come va oggi Oggi is today. Che si dice? Che si dice? What's up? Che si dice? Which is like, um, what's up? Che si dice uh, is uh, very informal and is more like, um, it's more like a kind of slang, Italian slang. It's not like proper formal Italian. So um, you, you say come stai, you know? Che si dice is more, uh, you know, um, let's, still if you meet your friend, you know, you have like a very uh, informal way to say things to each other, you know? You don't speak like a uh, high Italian, you know? So uh, che si dice is pretty much used for, uh, to say like, how are you, how is your life? Is the same of uh, come va? And um, come stai? Buon pomeriggio. Good afternoon. Buon pomeriggio. Buon pomeriggio. Good afternoon. Come stai? How are you? Uh, usually Italian people, uh, we, we used to say um, when we meet like a friend, uh, ciao come stai? Like, um, which means hello, how are you? You know, but you can also say, ciao, come va? Hello, how are you? Come va? Is the same of come stai? Piacere di conoscerti. Piacere di conoscerti. It's nice to meet you. Piacere di conoscerti. Piacere di conoscerti. Nice to meet you. You can also say, è stato un piacere conoscerti. È stato un piacere conoscerti. When you meet someone like for the first time and you like the person, you know, you say, uh, it has been nice to meet you, you know, uh, which is different than nice to meet you, which is when you actually meet the person for the first time, then you say piacere. You can also say just piacere, you know, when you uh, give your hand to, 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 to the person that you're meeting, you can say just piacere. And the person might uh, answer uh, to you, piacere mio, which is my pleasure, you know. Come vanno le cose? Come vanno le cose? How is everything? Come vanno le cose? Come vanno le cose? How is everything? So, come vanno le cose is, uh, uh, it refers to something uh, really general. So, how is your life in general, you know? But it's, it's used quite a lot in Italy, this phrase, come vanno le cose. So, 
And uh, with this very nice phrase, we actually reached the end of our lesson, the top 10 ways to say hello in Italian. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Here is Ilaria, ItalianPod101.com. And guys, I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye-bye. Take care. Want to speed up your language learning? Get access to all of our best PDF cheat sheets for free. Just click the link in the description and sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Accordion. Fisarmonica. Fisarmonica. Activity. Attività. Attività. Aerobics. Aerobica. Aerobica. Airplane. Aereo. Aereo. Album. 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 Alcohol. 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 Amusement park. Luna park. Luna park. Animation. Animazione. Animazione. Aquarium. Aquario. Aquario. Arrive. Arrivare. Arrivare. Art. Arte. Arte. Auto racing. Corsa di automobili. Corsa di automobili. Badminton. Volano. Volano. Ball. 
Palla. Palla. Ballet. Balletto. Balletto. Band. Gruppo. Gruppo. Bar. 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 Baseball. 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 Basketball. Pallacanestro. Pallacanestro. Beach. Spiaggia. Spiaggia. Beer. Birra. Birra. Bellboy. Fattorino d'albergo. Fattorino d'albergo. Biography. Una biografia. Una biografia. Blog. 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 Boarding pass. Carta d'imbarco. Carta d'imbarco. Boat. Barca. Barca. Bobsled. Bob. Bob. Book. Libro. Libro. Bowling. 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 Boxing. Pugilato. Pugilato. Bridge. Ponte. Ponte. Broadcast. Trasmettere. Trasmettere. Bus. Autobus. Autobus.
cabin baita baita cafe caffetteria caffetteria calligraphy calligrafia calligrafia camera macchina fotografica macchina fotografica candle candela candela canoe canoa canoa car macchina macchina cartoon cartone animato cartone animato Castle Castello Castello Cave Caverna Caverna Cavern Caverna Caverna Cello Violoncello Violoncello Ceramic vase Ceramiche Ceramiche Champion Campione Campione Championship Campionato Campionato Channel Canale Canale Check in Check in Check in Check out Check out Check out Cheer. Fare il tifo. Fare il tifo. Cheese. Formaggio. Formaggio. Chess. Scacchi. Scacchi. Chocolate. Cioccolato. Cioccolato. Church. Chiesa. Chiesa. City. Città. Città. Hi guys, welcome to ItalianPod101.com. My name is Ilaria, nice to meet you, or nice to see you again. Today we are going to talk about the top 10 phrases to use when you're angry. So, let's start. Non sono affari tuoi. Non sono affari tuoi. It's none of your business. Non sono affari tuoi. Non sono affari tuoi. It's none of your business. 
You can also say, non ti riguarda, non ti riguarda. Sta zitto, sta zitto, shut up. Sta zitto, shut up. You can also say, fa silenzio. Lasciami in pace, lasciami in pace. Leave me alone. Lasciami in pace. Lasciami in pace. Leave me alone. You can also say lasciami stare. It's the same as saying uh, lasciami in pace. Lasciami stare. Stai scherzando? Stai scherzando? Are you kidding me? Stai scherzando? Stai scherzando? Are you kidding me? Non importa. Non importa. Whatever. Non importa. Whatever. You can also say non mi interessa. Which is the same as saying non importa. Smettila. Smettila. Cut it out. Smettila. Smettila. Cut it out. You can also say stop. Basta, you know, uh, I mean, you can also say stop in English and in Italian is basta, basta così, you know, cut it out. Non voglio parlare con te, non voglio parlare con te. I don't want to talk to you. Non voglio parlare con te, non voglio parlare con te. I don't want to talk to you. Sono sconvolto. Sono sconvolto. I'm upset. Sono sconvolto. I'm upset. Uh, you can also say um, uh, sono uh, dispiaciuto. Sono arrabbiato. Uh, there are other ways to say uh, that you are upset, you know. Sono dispiaciuto. E allora? E allora? So what? E allora? So what? You can also say, e quindi? It's the same. E allora? E quindi? Same thing. Chi ti credi di essere? Chi ti credi di essere? Who do you think you are? Chi ti credi di essere? Chi ti credi di essere? Who do you think you are? So, if you happen to be angry in Italy, you can actually use one of these uh, terms. Of course, I mean, uh, in regards of respect of the other person. But let's say, if you are angry, you can actually use this, this phrase. And uh, we actually reached the end of our lesson. So, thanks very much for listening, guys. Please subscribe, comment, and watch our next videos. Thanks very much, as usual. And bye. Take care from Ilaria. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how do reflexive verbs work? Reflexive verbs are one of those elements that don't really have an English counterpart. A verb in Italian is reflexive when the subject carries out the action on itself. Please note that not all verbs can be reflexive. The infinitive form of a reflexive verb is made by dropping the infinitive ending e from are, ere, and ire, and adding the pronoun si. For example, svegliare, svegliarsi, to wake up. Reflexive verbs, when conjugated, are preceded by a reflexive pronoun that complies with the subject. Let's see an example. Vestire, to dress. P.S. Vestirsi, reflexive form to get dressed. Maria veste il manichino. Vs. Maria si veste. In the first example, the object of the verb vestire is the mannequin, while in the second sentence the object is Maria herself. Subject and object coincide. The reflexive pronoun si is conjugated as follows. Io mi vesto. I get dressed. Tu ti vesti. You get dressed. Lei si veste, she gets dressed. Noi ci vestiamo, we get dressed. Voi vi vestite, you get dressed. Loro si vestono, they get dressed.
In compound tenses, reflexive verbs have essere to be as auxiliary verb, so we always form the passato prossimo of the reflexive verbs with essere. Let's see some examples. Maria si è vestita. Maria has got dressed. Ci siamo svegliati. We have woken up. We can also use reflexive verbs as reciprocal verbs. The subject is always plural. The reciprocity of the action that the verb expresses often translates in English as each other, for example. Noi ci amiamo. We love each other. Loro si salutano. They say hello to each other. It's easier than you thought, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto. See you soon. Hi guys, welcome to ItalianPod101.com. My name is Ilaria. Nice to meet you, or nice to see you again. Well, today we're going to talk about the top 10 phrases to survive at the station. So let's start. If you're planning to go to Italy uh, for uh, visiting my beautiful countries, it's quite important that you actually bear in mind those phrases. Uh, the first is, mi piacerebbe andare a. I'd like to go to. Uh, let's say that our case is uh, you're going to Milan. So in, in Italian you would say mi piacerebbe andare a Milano. E questo il binario giusto per Milano? Is this the right platform for Milan? So è questo il binario giusto per Milano. Milan, remember, is our case, but if you go to, to Florence, to Naples, so you can use it um, depending on where you're traveling. And the answer could be, uh, sì, è questo, no, non è questo. Sì, è questo, yes, it is. No, non è questo, no, it's not. So it could be actually simple, uh, or yes, or no, and they might give you direction where you where you should should, should go, you know. So, but usually, yes, they say um, if you if you ask if uh, it's the right platform, uh, si è questo? No, non è questo. A che ora c'è l'ultimo treno? What time is the last train? A che ora c'è l'ultimo treno? Ultimo treno means last train and imagine that the answer could be at 11.30 p.m. so uh, in Italian is alle 23 e 30. Dove cambio per Milano? Where do I change for Milan? Dove cambio per Milano? And the answer let's say could be you can change the third stop and in Italian third stop is terza fermata. So Può cambiare alla terza fermata. You can change at the third stop. Dov'è la stazione? Where is the station? Dov'è la stazione dei treni? Stazione dei treni? Train station. Uh, stazione dei bus? Bus station. So, dov'è la stazione del treno? Where is the train station? Dove è la stazione per il bus? Where is the bus station? Let's say the answer could be uh, turn left at the second crossroad past the square. In Italian uh, is prenda il secondo incrocio a sinistra dopo la piazza. So sinistra is left, destra is right. Square is piazza. Quanto costa fino a Milano? How much is to Milan? Remember that Milan is our case, but of course if you're going to Florence you could say uh, Quanto costa fino a Firenze? So how much is to uh, Naples? Quanto costa fino a Napoli? And let's say that the answer is uh, it's 10 euros to Milan. It's 10 euros to Florence. It's 10 euros to Naples. So Fino a Milano costa 10 euro. Fino a Napoli costa 10 euro. Fino a Firenze costa 10 euro. Questo autobus va a Milano? Does this bus go to Milan? Uh, same case as before, so remember you can apply this to every destination uh, that you, you actually um, have. 
in mind. So uh, the answer could be sì, ci va, no, non ci va. So yes, it does, no, it doesn't. In this case as well, it could also be sì or no, yes or not, or not, uh, without uh, ci va or non ci va. Uh, because in Italian, sì, ci va means yes, it's going there. Uh, no, non ci va, no, it's not going there, you know. Dov'è la fermata dell'autobus? Where is the bus stop? Dove è la fermata dell'autobus? Autobus is bus. Let's say that uh, is on the right going over the roundabout. We said before that left is sinistra and right is destra. So in this case the answer could be è a destra dopo la rotonda. Uh, rotonda is the roundabout. Rotonda because in Italian rotonda is something circular, like the roundabout. Um, so it's pretty much the same. A che ora c'è il prossimo autobus? What time is the next bus? A che ora c'è il prossimo autobus? But you can also say A che ora passa l'ultimo autobus? What time is the next bus? And again, the answer could be in 15 minutes, in 15 minuti, in half an hour, in 30 minuti, and so on, in an hour, in un'ora. Dove sono le macchinette dei biglietti? Dove sono le macchinette dei biglietti? Where are the ticket machines? If you want to make it a little bit complicated, then you can say, dove sono le macchinette? automatiche dei biglietti. Macchinette automatiche. Let's say that uh, they are in front of the ticket office. So, di fronte alla biglietteria. And with this very useful sentence, we actually reach the end of our lesson or of our top 10 phrases to know for uh, surviving at the station, guys. So thanks very much for listening. Please subscribe, comment, let us know what you want to hear in our nice Italian language. And thanks very much for listening as usual. Bye-bye. Take care from Ilaria. Bye-bye. Hi guys, welcome to ItalianPod101.com. My name is Ilaria, nice to meet you, or nice to see you again. Well, today we're going to talk about the five amazing love quotes from Italian songs. It's a very romantic topic, so get ready. Anche se non fossi un angelo, io non ti cambierei, perché sei bella, 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 bella come sei. Sei bella come ti vorrei. Even if you should not be an angel, I wouldn't change you because you are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful as you are. You are beautiful as I would want you. I'm speechless. <laughs> Gosh. The first song is from one very, very famous uh, Italian singer. Uh, it's from Rome and uh, uh, his name is Antonello Venditti. And the title of the song is uh, What a Treasure You Are, What a Sweetheart You Are, uh, which in Italian means um, Che tesoro che sei. And the song is by Antonello Venditti. So, anche se non fossi un angelo, io non ti cambierei, perché sei bella, 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 bella come sei. Sei bella come ti vorrei. Turbini e tempeste io cavalcherò, volerò tra i fulmini per averti. I will ride on storms and tempest, I will fly among lightning and thunder to have you. And the second song is from an Italian uh, singer, she's very famous as well, she's from Tuscany, if I, um, uh, I think it's, uh, she's definitely from Tuscany, and her name is uh, Gianna Nannini. And the song is entitled uh, Wonderful Creature, uh, in Italian is uh, Meravigliosa Creatura. So, turbini e tempeste io cavalcherò, volerò tra i fulmini per averti. So, means that you can actually, you're, you're, uh, you can uh, do whatever it takes uh, to get a loved one to you. So, it's definitely a very romantic way to express your love to someone. Perché siamo due destini che si uniscono, 
stretti in un istante solo, che segnano un percorso profondissimo dentro di loro. Which means, because we are two destinies combining in one tight instant, marking a very deep path inside of them. Um, this song is uh, by Tiro Mancino, which is a very famous band, and the song title is uh, Two Destinies, Due Destini. Very, very nice song, very, very nice band. C'era la notte e le sue stelle, e sul tuo viso era la luna. Così ho capito che per sempre non avrei amato più nessuna. There was the night and its any stars, and on your face was the moon. So I realized that I would not love nobody but you forever. And uh, this song is by a, a famous singer. It's called Cesare Cremonini. And the song is The Man Traveling Among the Stars. And in Italian is L'uomo che viaggia fra le stelle. Stelle in Italian is stars. Moon, moon is luna. E il vero amore può nascondersi, confondersi, ma non può perdersi mai. Sempre per sempre, dalla stessa parte, mi troverai. And real love may hide, blend, but may not get lost. You will find me on the same side, always and forever. Uh, the song is from another very famous singer, Francesco De Gregori, and the title is uh, Ever and Forever, Sempre e Per Sempre. So, Ever in Italian is Sempre, e Per Sempre is Forever. So, with a very, very romantic uh, sentence, we actually reach the end of our lesson, guys. Um, so, if you want to express love to uh, your girlfriend or boyfriend, you're very welcome to use our phrases, the most romantic Italian songs. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Uh, here is O by Ilaria and ItalianPod101.com. Uh, Take care, always. See you next time. Bye-bye. Want to speed up your language learning? Get access to all of our best PDF cheat sheets for free. Just click the link in the description and sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Hi guys, welcome to ItalianPod101.com. My name is Ilaria, nice to meet you, or nice to see you again. Today we are going to talk about the 10 gift ideas you must know in Italian. Just in case you have a new Italian boyfriend or girlfriend, or you want to have like, uh, you want to, you are in Italy and you want to buy something nice for yourself, you know? So let's start. Computer portatile. Laptop. Computer portatile. Laptop. Non mi piace portare il mio computer portatile al lavoro. I don't like to carry my laptop with me at work. Profumo. Perfume. Profumo. Perfume. Suo marito le ha regalato un profumo davvero costoso. Her husband gave her a very expensive perfume. Well, in general, perfume are very expensive. You should know the fragrance that the person like. I mean, it's, very, it's a very personal gift in a way. Uh, but it's also uh, usually a really appreciated gift by women and men. Uh, let's say if you are in an Italian shop, you know already the brand of the perfume you want to buy, uh, and you say, Avete il profumo di... And you say a name of the perfume, like, do you have uh, the perfume of... And you say the, the, the name of the brand of the perfume. Or you can say, uh, can I try the perfume of, for instance, potrei provare il profumo di, and you say the name, libro, book, libro, book. Regalare un bel libro è sempre una buona idea. Giving a good book as a gift is always a great idea, which is very true. Uh, I mean, you can find books for pretty much everything. So um, even if the person, you know, maybe is not uh, an unusual reader, you know, you might find something that uh, uh, is useful, you know. So definitely a book is a nice, good idea as a gift. Mappa del globo. World map. Mappa del globo. World map. 
Quando ero a scuola i miei genitori mi hanno regalato una splendida mappa del globo terrestre. When I was at school, my parents gave me a beautiful world map. Mappa del globo or mappa mondo. In Italian you can also say mappa mondo and it's actually the same thing. Macchina fotografica. Camera. Macchina fotografica. Camera. Ho regalato una nuova macchina fotografica a mia sorella per il suo compleanno. I gave a new camera to my sister for her birthday. You can also say, like, I want to buy a camera for my sister's birthday. So you say, uh, vorrei comprare una macchina fotografica per il compleanno di mia sorella. Smartphone. 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 L'anno scorso, per Natale, sono stati comprati molti smartphone. Last year, for Christmas, many smartphones were purchased. It's actually a very common now, and nowadays, I mean, it's, it's a very common uh, gift. So, in, Ita in Italy, it says, uh, uh, you pronounce it, uh, the, 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 sorry, the word is the same, so it's smartphone in Italian and smartphone in English. So, if you find yourself in Italy and if you want to buy a new smartphone that you find, you can say, um, vorrei acquistare uno smartphone. I would like to buy a smartphone. Console per videogiochi. Game console. Console per videogiochi. Game console. Tutti i bambini aspettano di ricevere una console per videogiochi. All kids expect to receive a game console. And I can say, not just kids, <laughs> adults as well. Uh, game consoles are, I think now, I mean, is, there, are, there is so much technology now inside this game console that you can pretty much do everything. You know, you can surf the web, you can take them with you, with your travel, so is pretty amazing what you can do. So that's the reason why it's a good way of entertaining, entertaining yourself when you travel as well. So many adults says it, have it as well. Dizionario. Dictionary. Dizionario. Dictionary. Per il mio compleanno vorrei un dizionario dall'inglese all'italiano. For my birthday I'd like an English-Italian dictionary. <laughs> Very good idea, especially if you are following us at italianpod101.com, guys. That's nice. Or you can say, um, yeah, you can say, uh, vorrei un dizionario per il mio compleanno, also. So I would like a dictionary for my birthday. Un volo per l'Italia. A flight to Italy. Un volo per l'Italia. A flight to Italy. Abbiamo deciso di regalarci un volo per l'Italia. We decide to buy a flight to Italy for us. Un volo per l'Italia, like a flight to Italy. This is something that you can, uh, let's say, you are in Italy, if you want to go from Milan to Rome, then you say, I would like uh, um, to take a flight to Rome, uh, to book a flight to Rome uh, in English. And in Italian would be, uh, vorrei prenotare un biglietto aereo per Roma or vorrei prenotare un volo per Roma mazzo di fiori bunch of flowers mazzo di fiori bunch of flowers per la prima cena al ristorante regalare un mazzo di fiori è così romantico For the first dinner at a restaurant, giving a bunch of flowers is so romantic. It's very charming, but flowers are very romantic anyway. And with this nice sentence, we actually reached the end of our lesson. So uh, that's it for now, guys. The top 10 gift ideas you must know in Italian. Thanks very much for listening and watching us. Please subscribe, comment, and let us always know what you want to hear in our nice Italian language next time. And always take care. Bye-bye from Ilaria. Bye-bye. Hi guys, welcome to italianpod101.com. My name is Ilaria, nice to meet you, or nice to see you again. And today we are going to talk about what are your top 10 language learning goals for the year. So, let's start. 
Finirò la serie Survival Phrases su italianpod101.com ascoltando due lezioni al giorno. I'll finish Survival Phrases series on italianpod101.com by listening two lessons a day. Finirò la serie Survival Phrases su italianpod101.com ascoltando due lezioni al giorno. In Italian you can also say um, guarderò due lezioni al giorno su italianpod101.com which means I'll watch two lessons a day on italianpod101.com Finirò di leggere un libro in italiano leggendo 10 pagine al giorno. I'll finish reading one Italian book by reading 10 pages a day. Finirò di leggere un libro in italiano leggendo 10 pagine al giorno. In this case as well you can say um, leggerò 10 pagine al giorno di un libro italiano which means I'll read 10 pages a day of an Italian book supererò il mio test di lingua italiana I'll pass my Italian test supererò il mio test di lingua italiana <laughs> and I hope you do really Capirò completamente un film italiano guardandolo tutti i giorni. I'll fully understand one Italian movie by watching it every day. Capirò completamente un film italiano guardandolo tutti i giorni. Uh, you can also say um, se guardo un film italiano tutti i giorni imparerò la lingua. If I watch an Italian movie every day, I will learn the language. Memorizzerò cinque canzoni italiane, which means I'll memorize five Italian songs. Memorizzerò cinque canzoni italiane. Memorizzerò cinque canzoni italiane. You can also say imparerò cinque canzoni italiane, which means I will learn. Imparo is to learn, imparare, to learn. Riuscirò a memorizzare 350 parole con le flashcard su italianpod101.com. I'll finish memorizing 350 words with flashcards on italianpod101.com. Riuscirò a memorizzare 350 parole con le flashcard su italianpod101.com. But you can also say, I will learn 350 uh, words, which in Italian is, imparerò 350 parole con le flashcard su italianpod101.com Scriverò 10 cartoline in italiano ai miei amici italiani. I'll write 10 postcards in Italian to my Italian friends. Scriverò 10 cartoline in italiano ai miei amici italiani. Imparerò come parlare di eventi passati, presenti e futuri. I learn how to talk about past, present and future events. Imparerò come parlare di eventi passati, presenti e futuri. Padroneggerò 150 parole memorizzando 5 parole al giorno. I'll master 150 words by memorizing 5 words a day. But you can also say, um, still, I will learn 150 words by memorizing five words a day. So in this case, it's not padroneggerò, which is, might be a bit difficult, but it's like 
uh, imparerò, I will learn, imparerò a presentarmi per un colloquio di lavoro. I'll learn how to introduce myself for a job interview. Imparerò a presentarmi per un colloquio di lavoro. You can also say, um, I want to learn Italian for my job. Voglio imparare italiano per l'italiano. Voglio imparare l'italiano per il mio lavoro. And with this sentence, we actually reached the end of our lesson. So thanks very much for listening. Here is Ilaria, Italian Pod 101. I'll see you next time, guys. And um, always take care. Bye bye, next time. Welcome to Can Do Italian by ItalianPod101.com. Ciao a tutti, sono Felice Angelini. Hi everyone, I am Felice Angelini. In this lesson, you learn how to introduce yourself in Italian. This is Mark Lee, and he's on a plane to Italy. Paolo Parisi, a passenger sitting next to him, introduces himself by saying, Hello, I'm Paolo Parisi. Nice to meet you. Buongiorno, sono Paolo Parisi. Piacere. Listen to the conversation and focus on Mark's response. Ready? Buongiorno, sono Paolo Parisi. Piacere. Piacere. Sono Mark Lee. Once more with the English translation. Buongiorno, sono Paolo Parisi. Piacere. Hello, I'm Paolo Parisi. Nice to meet you. Piacere. Sono Mark Lee. Nice to meet you. I'm Mark Lee. Let's take a closer look at Mark's response. Do you remember how Mark Lee introduces himself? Nice to meet you. I'm Mark Lee. Piacere. Sono Mark Lee. First is the expression Piacere, meaning a pleasure. Piacere, piacere, piacere is actually a shortened version of Piacere di conoscerla, meaning it's a pleasure to meet you. Piacere di conoscerla. Both Mark and Paolo use the short form Piacere. In their introductions. This shortened version can be used in many contexts and is appropriate for both formal and informal situations. Do you remember how Mark says, I'm Mark Lee? Sono Mark Lee. First is, Sono. I am. Sono. Sono. Note. Sono. Is a shortened form of. Io sono. In Italian. Io. I is usually omitted as it can be understood from context. Sono. Is from the verb. Essere. Meaning to be. Essere. Next is the name. Mark Lee. Mark Lee. Mark Lee. Mark Lee. Together, it's... Sono Mark Lee. I'm Mark Lee. Sono Mark Lee. The pattern is... Sono. Name. I'm name. Sono. Name. To use this pattern, simply replace the name placeholder with your name. Imagine you're Karen Lee. In Italian, Karen Lee. Karen Lee. Karen Lee. Say, I'm Karen Lee. Ready? Sono Karen Lee. I'm Karen Lee. Sono Karen Lee.
Let's look at some more examples. Listen and repeat, or speak along with the native speakers. Piacere, sono Paolo Parisi. Piacere, sono Paolo Parisi. Piacere, sono Mark Lee. Piacere, sono Mark Lee. Piacere, sono Karen Lee. Piacere, sono Karen Lee. Piacere, sono Felice Angelini. Piacere, sono Felice Angelini. Piacere, mi chiamo Rosa Romano. Piacere, mi chiamo Rosa Romano. Did you notice how the last speaker uses a different pattern? She says, Mi chiamo Rosa Romano. My name is Rosa Romano. Mi chiamo Rosa Romano. This pattern uses the phrase, Mi chiamo, which literally means, I myself call, but translates as, My name is. Mi chiamo. Mi chiamo. First is, Mi. Meaning, me. Mi. Mi. After this is, Chiamo. Meaning, I call. Chiamo. Chiamo. Note. Chiamo. Is the shortened form of? Io chiamo. In Italian, Io. I is usually omitted. Chiamo. Is from the verb chiamare. To call. Chiamare. Next is the name Rosa Romano. Rosa Romano. Rosa Romano. Rosa Romano. All together. Mi chiamo Rosa Romano. Literally, myself I call Rosa Romano, but it translates as my name is Rosa Romano. Mi chiamo Rosa Romano. The pattern is Mi chiamo name. My name is name. Mi chiamo name. You should be aware of this pattern, but for this lesson, we'll use the pattern Sono Name. I'm name. Sono name. Let's review the key vocabulary. Buongiorno. Hello. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Let's review. Respond to the prompts by speaking aloud. Then repeat after me, focusing on pronunciation. Ready? Do you remember how to say, nice to meet you? Piacere. Piacere. And the Italian pronunciation of Mark Lee's name? Mark Lee. Mark Lee. Do you remember how Mark Lee says, I'm Mark Lee? Sono Mark Lee. Sono Mark Lee. And do you remember how Mark Lee says, Nice to meet you, I'm Mark Lee. Piacere, sono Mark Lee. Piacere, sono Mark Lee. Do you remember how Paolo Parisi says, hello? Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Do you remember how Paolo Parisi says, hello, I'm Paolo Parisi. Nice to meet you.
Buongiorno, sono Paolo Parisi. Piacere. Buongiorno, sono Paolo Parisi. Piacere. Let's practice. Imagine you're Karen Lee. Karen Lee. Respond to Paolo Parisi's self-introduction. Ready? Buongiorno, sono Paolo Parisi. Piacere. Piacere, sono Karen Lee. Listen again and repeat. Piacere, sono Karen Lee. Piacere, sono Karen Lee. Let's try another. Imagine you're Rosa Romano. Rosa Romano. Ready? Buongiorno, sono Paolo Parisi. Piacere. Piacere. Sono Rosa Romano. Listen again and repeat. Piacere. Sono Rosa Romano. Piacere. Sono Rosa Romano. Let's try one more. Imagine you're Felice Angelini. Felice Angelini. Ready? Buongiorno, sono Paolo Parisi. Piacere. Piacere, sono Felice Angelini. Listen again and repeat. Piacere, sono Felice Angelini. Piacere, sono Felice Angelini. In casual situations, you can also use this pattern with just your first name. For example, in the case of Karen Lee, you can simply say Sono Karen. I'm Karen. Sono Karen. This is the end of this lesson. Remember, these can-do lessons are about learning practical language skills. What's next? Show us what you can do. When you're ready, take your assessment. You can take it again and again, so try any time you like. Our teachers will assess it and give you your results. Well done. Now you know how to introduce yourself in Italian. That's all there is to it. Keep practicing and move on to the next lesson. This is the end of this lesson. Remember, these can-do lessons are about learning practical language skills. Each lesson brings you closer to natural, fluent Italian. Want to learn to speak even more Italian the fast, fun, and easy way? Then sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. Sign up in seconds. Access hundreds of audio and video lessons and start speaking like a native speaker. Well done. Now you know how to introduce yourself in Italian. That's all there is to it. Keep practicing and move on to the next lesson. Want to speed up your language learning? Take your very first lesson with us. You'll start speaking in minutes and master real conversations. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Just click the link in the description.